Jeden, jeden. Ok, wchodzi. Dobra. Jeden, jeden. Jeden. Jeden, jeden. No dobra. Jeden, jeden. No dobrze, wchodzi. Jeden. Cześć Dawid.
Okay, it seems that apart from the Warsaw participants of the conference, everyone are here. Um, so, so before we start, let's give a, a two or three minutes more to for those technical things. But before we'll start, just just a two technical announcements. So, if you want to leave your jacket, there's a place in the back to do that. And and another is related with with. Um, with the epidemic situation um, in Poland, which is quite tough, so, so considering that and considering the um, rules of state rules and also university rules, we, we, we kindly ask you to, to, to follow this COVID rules, so to keep distances, to, to use the hand sanitizer which is available on the back. Um, uh, you know, we recommend you to stay in masks, but I know that it might be difficult, so... But, but if any of you need masks, there are also masks on the, on the registration table. And I will be back in, in, in two minutes, okay? So we're already late, <laughs> which is not a good sign. Uh, all right, so uh, let me start. So, so um, good morning. Uh, I would like to, to welcome, on behalf of, of myself and the co-organizer of this conference, Jan Vida Sigurdsson and Stefan Hoppe, I would like to welcome all of you to the conference, the cult of saints and legitimization of elite power in East Central Europe and Scandinavia until 1300. Um, as for me, and then probably for many of you, this is the, the first conference in person for months, or if not for years. So let me express uh, what a great feeling is that to, that we can meet face to face, that we can meet here on the campus of the Warsaw University. I'm, I'm really, really excited. So I would like to, to welcome all of you, especially warmly all those who, who are contributing to this conference, and by giving papers, by chairing sessions, most, most of them are here or will be here because they are late. <laughs> um, we have, however, also three online participants. Uh, so, 
Helen, Kirsty, and David, I hope you are there and we send you best greetings from Warsaw. Uh, so I would like to, to welcome our attenders here in room, but also those who, who follow us on the YouTube channel, the Faculty of History of Warsaw University. Um, as I hope all you know already, this conference is the part of the Norway Grants Project, Symbolic Resources and Political Structures on the Periphery, Legitimization of the Elites in Poland and Norway around 1300, uh, which is a joint enterprise of two institutions, University of Warsaw, Faculty of History, and University of Oslo, Department of Archaeology, uh, Conservation, and History. So I'm happy to say that um, uh, deans of both institutions, uh, Łukasz niesiowski Span and Jan Vida Sigurdsson, are with us today. So as we are hosted by the Faculty of History of the Warsaw University, let me start by asking Dean Łukasz niesiowski Spano to take the floor. Thank you, Grzegorz, and uh, welcome everyone here at the University of Warsaw in the Faculty of History. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, host you and welcome you here in, in Warsaw uh, for this conference. Um, I'm welcome, um, uh, especially warm welcome goes to the par partners of the project from Norway, being on-site and online. Um, uh, all speakers, uh, the conference uh, looks uh, fascinating, the uh, range of topics uh, still being uh, medieval, uh, touch upon some topic which can be uh, seen as actual as well. Uh, actual is uh, the legitimization of power of the elites is something what we are discussing nowadays uh, they, uh, every day. Um, and uh, this is w one of the aspects why this uh, conference looks, looks so interesting for historian uh, um, here. I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the place we are gathering now here. This is one of the most beautiful uh, room in the University of Warsaw. Uh, we call it Column Hall. Uh, this is the only uh, untouched by the dangerous history of Poland building uh, built in the beginning of the 19th century, which was designed for the University of Warsaw, and we are proud to be uh, the host of the place, and we are very happy to uh, have the opportunity to uh, welcome you here in this uh, venue, which is uh, one of the best places for such conferences. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning to Cordin, uh, Fortunately, weather is not so nice as was during the weekend, so you will not be tempted to walk around. So I wish you a good two days of the presentations, discussions, and uh, social events, uh, which will uh, uh, help you to uh, have more uh, um, uh, understanding of this cult of science and legitimization of elite power, and so on, so on. So be safe, have a good conference, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, so now, probably according to the protocol, I should invite Jan Vidar to welcome you as a dean. But as we are not so keen on formalities, we decided that first I will tell you a few words uh, on our project, and then Jan Vidar will make an introduction to the conference. So, so our project uh, and title, let me, let me remind you of this title again, uh, symbolic resources and political structures on the periphery, legitimization of the elites in Poland and Norway around 1300. Um, it focuses on the forms and means of symbolic power employed by members of political elites in two peripheral areas of medieval Europe, uh, Norway and, and Poland. So the central concept here is the legitimacy of elites. Uh, which we understand as the idea of ruling classes that do not just rule, but deserve to do so. So the project takes, um, as this conference, a broad view on the elites, which includes all those who are privileged, not only rulers uh, or, and dynasties and their closest circles, but also officials, nobles and local leaders, and bishops and other churchmen, as well as ecclesiastical institutions and other privileged communities. 
Uh, chronologically, the project focuses uh, on the period between 1000 and 1300, that is the era between both Poland and Norway formally becoming Christian polities, and the moment each uh, was united as a stable monarchy. Thematically, the project uh, comparatively investigates, for example, dynastic ideology, um, cults of saints, as you, as you know already, elite graves and symbolic expression on, expressions on coins, legitimization of episcopal and abbatial power, role of uh, ecclesiastical institutions, ceremonies of coronation, narrations about the past, as you can see, many, many topics. The project treats Poland and Norway in comparative fashion as two parallel examples of elites in two peripheral polities similarly and sometimes differently dealing with the same or similar type of problems related with the ongoing process of Christianization and Europeization. Interestingly, political elites of Poland and Norway did not have many direct contacts with each other during this period, which make them particularly useful for comparative study of the means of political structuring during the High Middle Ages on the European peripheries. The project is based on the close cooperation between the Polish and Norwegian medievalists, historians, but also archaeologists and numismatics. Um, this close cooperation means, basically speaking, that, that most of our articles, most of our publication will be written by at least two authors, Polish and Norwegian, to best use our expertise in the topic. And, and let, let, of course, to, to, to learn more about our project, you should uh, visit our website, and I, I strongly invite you to do so, and let me show you. So, so let me show you all here and those who are following us um, by YouTube channel, our website. You can see the address here. You can find it in the program as well. So you can learn here about the, the project. You can hear, here have also the, the section of news, for example, information about our conference. There are also information on our research. Hopefully, there will be some information about our publications. And probably what is the most important, you can, you can have a chance to get to know better our great, great team. And the, the website is available in English, in Polish, and partly also in Norwegian Bookmall. Um, so, so please visit the, that. Please follow us also on Facebook. We are also uh, there, and oh, sorry, I will, I will come back here. So, so what I also should 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 tell you is that um, the elites project, as I have already said, uh, carried out by the University of Warsaw and University of Oslo, is funded uh, from the Norway grants as a part of the Greek call with the basic research program with National Science Center Poland as a program operator and research council of Norway as program partner. Greek is one of the three calls for a proposal funded under the third edition of EEA and Norway grants 2014-2021 under the research program with National Science Center Poland acting as a program operator in charge of basic research. So the objective of the program is to improve research-based knowledge development as well as to encourage the Polish-Norwegian research cooperation. The EEA and Norway grants are the form of foreign aid granted by Norway, Iceland, I'm welcoming here the representatives of Iceland, and Liechtenstein to new EU members, including Poland. It seems that we are still a new member and will always probably be the new member of EU. All right, before Jan Vida make the introduction to the conference and tell you more about um, some ideas, um, let me explain what place it takes in our project. So for us, 
Elite's team, the, the conference is the opportunity, of course, to tell you more about our project and in some cases at least present preliminary effects of our research. We hope that meeting with you might be an opportunity for us to confront our research with our other specialists and to receive feedback. But inviting researchers from outside the team to cooperate with us, and let me express again how, how grateful we are that, that you accept this invitation, we also want to use your expertise in the topic and learn from you and your research. So finally, we also decided that it would be a good idea, that it would be very fruitful to have a chance to look to the topic of our project from broader perspective. And that is why instead of focusing uh, exclusively on Poland and Norway, we decided to make East Central Europe and Scandinavia an area of interest of this conference, an important context for our own research in the project. And, and last but, but not least, as we are grateful to benefactors who make our research possible, the conference is for us also the chance to promote our donor Norway grants and its research program. So that's enough, I think, from, from my side. And now I would like to, to invite Jon Vida. As you probably already noticed, Jon Vida is a man of many hats. He is a dean of the, of the uh, Department of Archaeology and Conservation and History at the University of Warsaw. Of Oslo, of course. Uh, he, he is a medievalist and a member of Elite's team. And last but not least, uh, he is a co-organizer of this conference. So, so Jon Vidar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gregos. I have no intention to, well, at least we have a quite intense program ahead of us. So I have no intention to give a long speech before the start of the first session. However, it is important to mention the reason why we are here today. Well, that is the work of Gregos and his team. They managed to get funding from this Greek program, and that is a great achievement. There was a very tough competition. And uh, there are many challenges that lies ahead of Gregos and his team, and therefore, in the light of the spirit of this conference, I wish that all of you, in your prayers, ask your closest friends, that of the saints that you are studying, to ask the Almighty to protect Gregor and his team, not from the tournaments of hell, but from Norwegian and Polish bureaucracy. And uh, with these words, I just give the floor to you, Stefan. And Stefan is uh, from the University of Oslo, and he will give a paper which is called uh, The Legitimization Episcopal Authority in 12th Century Denmark. Stefan, the floor is yours. We are told to keep our introductions short and sweet, so um, I just would like to express my, my gratitude to those of you who have shown up here. Uh, I'm part of the Elites project. Those of you who uh, do not know me, I'm, I'm mostly working on the cult of saints, of the writing of history, and of the construction of identity in the, in the Middle Ages. And I, I'm hoping that I will be addressing uh, most of these, if not all of these, issues in the course of my little talk. Um, and my, my presentation uh, is focused on um, Episcopal authority in, um, in Denmark, 
in 12th century Denmark. And uh, one of the main questions that, that the project is concerned with is um, why, uh, or, or not only that elites have um, had the right to rule, but also that they deserve to rule. And it is important to remember that when we talk about rulership, uh, it comes in many forms and in many sizes. So we might be accustomed to think of rulership in terms of uh, kings, queens, um, emperors, empresses. Bishops were also, in their way, um, authority figures and, um, and exerted some form of rulership. And that rulership was uh, often contested, especially at an early stage in the, um, <clears throat> in the well, in the Christian history of, of uh, the medieval um, polities and even, even throughout the medieval period, uh, the boundaries of Episcopal authority were, were contested and challenged. So what I'm um, hoping to emphasize today is especially uh, the way in which Episcopal authority could be challenged, could be threatened in 12th century Denmark and what strategies uh, bishops could take in order to cement uh, their Episcopal power and their authority. So, um, if we could, let's see. Yes, everything is fine. Right, um, in order to show this, uh, I have uh, I've focused on uh, three case studies from 12th century Denmark. There are, there are more uh, to be found, but I wanted to limit myself to these, to these three. And the purpose, in, in general, is uh, to see three different ways of using the cult of saints, and especially um, one particular saint, to, uh, to, um, uh, well, to prove to the audiences that, that, uh, that may be that this bishop and this uh, Episcopal institution not only had authority but deserved to have this authority and that this authority was protected or guaranteed um, by, the, uh, by the saints and by a specific cult of saints. You will see here that we are going to focus on, or I am going to focus on Odense, uh, Ribe and in Lund. And this is organized chronologically, more or less. But just to set the scene, um, the reason why I've chosen 12th century Denmark is, first of all, that there is quite a lot of material, uh, but also because the 12th century is a very important period in Danish Episcopal history, uh, because it is then, in this period, that the church becomes a more unified um, institutional identity. It becomes a political power in its own right. It, um, starts to emerge from the protection of the kings into its, uh, it, its own capability of protecting itself and to, and to wield its authority. Um, it is still in need of secular protection, but uh, it is at this point more um, institutionally capable of also protecting itself. Um, and this comes in the, um, sort of at the, at the tail end of the, of the uh, uh, evolution of Episcopal history in 11th century Denmark. You can see here a, a very short uh, overview of, of that development. I'm not going to go into, into details. Um, but we see that with the establishment of the Archbishopric of Lund in 1104, um, things started to become more, uh, well, the, the Church of Denmark started to become more of its own um, institution, more of its own authority, although that also was contested, and as we see, one archbishop had to go into exile because of, um, uh, because of his quarrels with the, with the king. So, <clears throat> the first example is also the, uh, the case of the first royal saint of Denmark, at least according to, to uh, um, the current scholarly consensus. There are some, some earlier um, ideas about that, but I'll leave that aside. Uh, this concerns Knut uh, or K 
Canute, uh, however you want to pronounce that, the, uh, the king who was murdered in, uh, in the church of St. Alban in Odense in 1086. Um, he was proclaimed a saint by a local synod of all the Danish bishops in 1095, and at this point in history, that was all you needed to really uh, be confirmed uh, and proclaimed as a saint. Now, in the, in the following decades, this cult um, became the, the uh, starting point of a long line of uh, textual productions. We have four, uh, four titles, two saint biographies, one poem, um, one inscription, and then, of course, a liturgical office based on, uh, on the saint biographies. And um, when, this was, when, when this textual production was, was being written down, when that was disseminated, when that was being read, and, and, uh, um, and when that was the foundation for, for, the, for the liturgy to be performed, uh, this was a time when, when uh, the bishopric of Odense was one of the uh, less strong, less, less wealthy of the... Um, uh, of, of the Danish bishoprics, and it was it was not the it, it was neither the oldest nor the nor the most um, important at the time, and this might explain in some way uh, why the uh, the cult of Saint Knut became as important as it was. There were, of course, also other reasons, um, and this is exactly why. Um, this is exactly why the, the bishops of Odense uh, appears to have um, used this, this cult quite deliberately in order, to, um, in order to strengthen their episcopal authority. Now, in order to legitimize um, episcopal power, there usually needs to be some sort of, uh, if not crisis moment, then at least some pressure that, that uh, that necessitates the uh, the uh, emphasis of of authority and and uh, and episcopal power. And in the case of Odense, um, there were two main issues at stake. First of all, there seems to have been uh, a drive towards establishing a kind of primacy within the Danish ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, now, like I said, it was neither the oldest nor the most important bishopric, and by 1104, it was, um, well, the, the, uh, the Metropolitan See was placed in Lund, so it wasn't, it, it could not, Odense could not become the primus in the pares of, of Danish churches, but they did have St. Knut Rex. They did have the first royal saint, they did have um, the most important um, saintly figure. And so this, allowed them to, to employ this cult in order to establish um, another kind of primacy, if not the oldest, if not the most important, then at least the one protected by uh, the saint, or the, the most important saint according to the clerics at, at Odense. Uh, there was also uh, a need to counter a negative cultural memory that was centered on Knutrex. He was known um, for his harsh taxation. Uh, he had been murdered by insurrectionists, and many of those uh, were either still alive at the beginning of this cult, or, um, or their children were. So there was a persistent uh, negative cultural memory that also uh, continued way into the, uh, the mid-12th century. Uh, Saxo Grammaticus criticizes this in, the, uh, in, in his Gesta Danorum, which also goes to show how far into, into the 12th century, this negative cultural memory persisted. So those were the, the uh, pressures that required the legitimization of episcopal power and authority. We then move on uh, to the strategies. Um, and in the, in the uh, vitae of Knut, there are especially two uh, features of Knut the Saint that become salient in this, in this uh, strategy. One is to emphasize that he was the proto-martyr of Denmark. Now, this is, of course, a very important title. He's the first Denmark and da uh, 
first time, sorry. He's the first martyr on, on Danish soil. He's therefore the Danish equivalent of Saint Stephen, the proto-martyr. Uh, and this is the kind of, uh, of status that gives primacy to a bishopric. Odense is the, is the cult center. They have, um, they have the remains of the proto-martyr of Denmark. Um, another way to, to emphasize this primacy of Ordense um, is, to, is to emphasize that Knut was not only the patron of the bishopric, he was the patron of all of Denmark. And this is expressed in, as, especially in um, uh, the second vita, the so-called Gesta Svena Magni. Um, and uh, here we see that, that Knut is also, um, well, he's he's uh, described in very ambiguous terms, so not only as the patron, uh, patron of all of Denmark, but indeed all of the northern uh, areas, which Norwegians would be, quite, um, uh, would be quite unimpressed with, considering that they had St. Olaf and also um, uh, other saints in, in place, but uh, because of this ambiguity, they, they, uh, the bishop and the clerics of um, Odense would emphasize the primacy of, of their own bishopric. Now, um, moving on to the, to the second um, case study, we come to, to uh, Ribe, which was one of the oldest bishoprics, and uh, in some ways perhaps also one of the most uh, wealthy ones, because it was a, it was a, um, a thriving uh, hub of trade. And it seems that the bishops were quite independent, uh, at, at least um, with respect to, to uh, or in, in relation to secular powers. Um, but there is one interesting case, and that comes from the, from the mid 12th century, and it concerns the cult of Liuftag uh, of Ribe. Now, Liuftag was um, a missionary, he was originally from, uh, from Friesland. And uh, according to a tradition recorded in the 13th century, he was a martyr. Um, this is, uh, we, we do not know when, when this uh, claim came about. Uh, Adam of Bremen mentions Liuftag, but not as a martyr. So it is possible that the claim of, of uh, Liuftag's martyrdom has come about as a challenge to the claim that Knut was the proto-martyr of, um, of Denmark. But this is, this is not clearly stated because we do not have the source material that, allow us to, that, that allows us to, to make such, um, or draw such conclusions. Now, um, the background for, uh, for the use of Liuftag as, as a uh, um, legitimizing factor of the, of the Episcopal authority comes from the, the um, recent events um, in the mid 12th century Denmark and mid 12th century Riva. Uh, in 1145, there was established a new cathedral chapter, uh, or sorry, a, a cathedral chapter, um, and then shortly thereafter, a, a new cathedral church was, uh, was begun. It's the one I've used uh, as my background for this presentation, although that is a modern, um, mostly modern renovation. Anyway, um, as we see here. Now, um, the causes or the, the, the pressure points that brought about the, the use of Liuftag as a legitimizing uh, factor um, can be, can be uh, summarized into two main points. First of all, there were the financial demands of the new cathedral. Um, the stone for that cathedral was imported from the, from the Rhine, uh, Rhine region. So it was not it, it was not local. It was it was costly to to import. Uh, it was also a, a large stone church, and uh, it, it the building went on for um, for quite some time, also because it it later burned. But this, of course, put a lot of financial pressure on the bishop, and uh, as a way to to uh, alleviate that financial pressure, we can imagine that. Uh, the translation of Liuftag in the 1160s was meant to attract more pilgrims. Um, and of course that, that um, would in turn highlight or, or, or increase the, um, the standing of the bishopric and thus the authority of the bishop. 
Now, another thing was that the bishop who, who um, uh, performed this translation was uh, a very controversial figure. Uh, he was charged with manslaughter. Uh, he was in, uh, in, um, uh, he was in, uh, in a brawl with his, uh, with his cathedral chapter. Um, and he was a very, very, um, well, according to the later reader chronicle, he was a very difficult figure. Now, it is very possible that this controversy that delayed his, uh, his, um, the start of his bishopric might have been a way for, for, um, <clears throat> for Bishop Radov to, um, uh, to cement his authority as the legitimate um, bishop. And in this case, the, the strategy for doing that is the translation of uh, the relics. Now, um, I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to go a bit more quickly through the next uh, case. And that is a bit of a strange case because it is not a Danish saint. It is a saint that has not been uh, in Denmark. But it is the cult of um, a, a saint that became of universal renown very quickly and who became a symbol of the reformist church and therefore a symbol of uh, uh, ecclesiastical and also episcopal authority. Now, the cult of Thomas of Canterbury was imported into Denmark uh, probably already in the 1170s, probably um, by, by Archbishop Eskil, who had been in conflict with, with King Valdemar and, uh, and had gone into exile, much like Thomas himself had gone into exile. Um, and he was brought into, uh, his cult was brought into Lund, his liturgy was established in the, uh, in the, um, in the Lund uh, offices, or the, sorry, the, the, um, the Lund breviaries, and we see here a, a, a late, um, a late breviary containing some of his, um, some of his office. Now the courses um, can be summarized as as um, being rooted in the the conflict between Archbishop and King, uh, also Archbishop Eskil's reformist agenda, and the possible fear that this conflict that had been in place would be renewed uh, later on. Of course, the relationship between king and bishop uh, was always um, very unstable in the, in the medieval period. So my suggestion is that um, Eskil of Lund felt that his legitimacy as archbishop was uh, under threat, and as a uh, way to legitimize this power, he introduced the cult of a saintly figurehead of the reformist cause, and this provided the cathedral chapter in Lund with a saint um, that came from their own estate that they could identify with and that they could rally around um, in, the, in the event that they needed to, um, that they needed to face the, the uh, infringement of secular power once again. Now, all these three um, cases highlight the various ways in which uh, Episcopal power could be challenged or could be threatened. Um, I use power and authority here a bit interchangeably. Um, and also it shows that the cult of saints could be used in, in several ways um, in order to, to strengthen and create a bulwark for, for that uh, authority. Uh, these are just some of the ways. Uh, I've gone through it a bit quickly, but um, um, I, I hope in the in the proceedings of this of this conference to to uh, flesh out some of the uh, some of the finer details a bit more. But I, I hope to have made the, the point um, quite well sufficiently that 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 um, the cult of saints were used in, in very different ways and through uh, different strategies in order to legitimize episcopal power in, in 12th century Denmark and also in the Middle Ages in general. Thank you. Stefan, then I would like to give the floor to the second speaker of this session, uh, Esther Conrad, uh, National Sheni Library, and the title of her paper is Sanctity in Service, Saints in the Legislation of the Presence of the Order of Preachers in Hungary. 
Rest of the floor is yours. organizers I would like to say thank you for the invitation and I'm very happy to be able to participate participate physically in this very nice conference and today I'm going to speak about how the saints uh, of the Dominican order were used in the legitimization of their power uh, in Hungary since the time of their settlement in the kingdom of Hungary in the early 1220s the recently founded Order of Preachers and the Order of Minor Brothers contributed greatly to the formation of late medieval saintly idea, popularizing primarily the saints and the saintly candidates of their own orders, both on institutional and less formal levels. The priors were mobile and the primary tool for their activity directed at conversion was preaching. They took vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. Hungary, situated on the periphery of Latin Christianity, was of key importance in their mission among the Cumans and the heretic groups in the Balkans, especially until the mid-13th century. The Dominicans' conscious relic politics directed at the strengthening of their presence throughout Europe and the promotion of their saints could have contributed to the fact that from the 13th century, much more sources pertaining to their activity in Hungary have come down to us than Franciscan ones. The Order of Preachers distributed relics of their two recently canonized saints, Saint Dominic and Saint Peter of Verona, also in Hungary. Besides, also a spontaneous cult started to emerge in 1270 in the proximity of the tomb of Princess Margaret, who lived as a nun in the Dominican female monastery dedicated to the Virgin Mary on the island of the Hares near Buda, today uh, you know this place as the Margit Siget, which soon became and remo remained for centuries one of the most popular shrines in the kingdom. The friars in Hungary made use of these saints and the saintly candidate in various ways, including the legitimization of their presence and activity in the kingdom, both towards the whole order and the local population. In my presentation, I even investigate these two directions. First, I explore why the miracles from Hungary were of special importance to the order of preachers and through what channels the local Dominicans communicated these to the greater public outside Hungary. Second, I show that they accomplished the second by convincing the locals about the miracle working capacities of their saints and attracting them to their churches where the saints' earthly remains were preserved. Taking a few examples from sermons written for the feasts of their saints, I also highlight some features that shed light on why they, and through them, the Dominican order were considered novel and attractive. The Hungarian province was among the first eight provinces of the order of preachers. Paulus Hungarus, with four other priors from the Bologna Studium, was sent here in 1221 to organize it. The friars became popular with Prince Béla, the future King Béla IV, and probably also with Robert, Archbishop of Estergom, the most important ecclesiastical authority in Hungary at that time. The mission among the Cumans was the common interest of both the Dominicans and the Archbishop. The Cumans, pagan nomadic tribes were the eastern neighbors of Hungary. The friars' mission in the 1220s was quite successful and the Archbishop of, of Estergom placed a Dominican friar to direct the newly founded human bishopric, the bishopric of Milko. The resultful missionary enterprise was put to an end by the Mongolian invasion in Hungary in 1241 and 42. And after this, the conversion of the Cumans started to be gradually taken over by the Franciscans. The Dominicans were entrusted also with fighting the Bogomils in Bosnia, and they proved to be so efficient that another missionary bishopric was created, and its first bishop was the Dominican Johannes Teutonicus. 
The results of the mission in Bosnia were similarly annihilated by the Mongolians. The center of the Hungarian province was established in Buda in the proximity of the royal palace. It also housed the Studium Generale as well from, the 13, from 1304 onwards. King Bela and his consort, Mary Lascaris, founded a female Dominican monastery on the island of the Hares near Buda around 1247 in order to house their daughter, Margaret, and her fellow nuns in their proximity. Also, a house was built here for the friars who were responsible for the spiritual care of the nuns. The importance of the Hungarian Dominic Dominican province was attested also by two general chapters that were held here in the 13th century. In 1254 in Buda, on the right side of the river Danube, and in 1273 in Pest, on the other side of the Danube. At the general chapter of Buddha, one of the main events was the baptism of the human chieftain and his wife as a symbolic accomplishment of the mission of the preachers originating from St. Domini. The order expanded dynamically under the support of King Bela IV until the 1260s. However, from the second half of the 1260s, the royal couple preferred the Franciscan around them and the friars' preachers seem to have lost their special privileged position in the court. Now let us see how the Dominicans used their saints in the legitimization of their presence in the kingdom. The relics of Saint Dominic, the founder, and, also, and Peter of Verona, also known as Peter Martyr, an erudite preacher and inquisitor in Lombardy who was assassinated in 1251, were taken also to Hungary shortly after their canonization in 1234 and 1252, respectively. The presence of the relic of a saint was equal to the presence of the saint himself, who mediated between humans and God, and whose power was sought after both the patron and the miracle worker. The relics, which could be so-called primary relics, the pieces of the saint's body or secondary relics, the clothes and any object with which the saint was in physical connection were often cut into smaller and smaller pieces, but their power did not diminish so that the saint could be practically omnipresent. The Dominicans soon recognized the potential in the dispersion of, their, of the relics of their saints could be conductive to miracles attributed to the saints themselves, which in turn could be an efficient means to the introduction and the solidification of their cult in regions which were quite far from where these two men were active. The Hungarian province and the miracles that occurred here were significant for a number of reasons. First, it was a missionary territory where the Dominicans were successful in gaining food in a short time. Second, the miracles attested to the devotion to Dominican saints among the local population. Third, as a missionary territory where the Dominicans suffered great losses during their conversion activities to the east and to the south, and was recently devastated and was still threatened by the Mongolians, it needed the presence of the founder and the first mendicant martyr. The relics of the two saints were probably obtained at the first translation of the body of Saint Dominic in 1233, and in Peter's case in 1253, but it is not known when exactly they arrived in Hungary. These relics were fundamental in the creation of some kind of a local cult around the church of the convent where they were housed. Dominic's relics were placed in the altar dedicated to him in Erdsomjo in southeastern Hungary, in the church of the Dominican convent founded probably by King Bela. Peter's relic was deposited in the Dominican church of Patak, today called Sáros Patak, in the northeastern, in northeastern Hungary, on the road that led to the Principality of Galicia, Volhynia. The only source of the miracles of Peter and uh, of Dominic and Peter in Hungary is Dominican hagiography. The friar's ro role was pivotal in registering them, and the convent's leaders was responsible for their communication to the master generals. Dominic's miracles collected from Shomyo were first incorporated by Constantine of Orvieto in his Legend of Saint Dominic in 1247, and a selection of them were reported in all the saints' subsequent legends in the next 200 years, including the Legenda Aurea, so they were quite well known outside the order. 
Another 22 miracles are known from Shomyo, of which 20 were collected before 1245. The miracles are reported in a hierarchical order. The six raisings of the, of the dead are followed by 13 healing miracles, and the list ends with a devotional miracle of a pious elderly woman who wanted to have a votive mass celebrated in honor of Saint Dominic. Constantine, in his legend, after narrating the miracles that occurred at the tomb of Saint, du Saint Dominic in Bologna, turns to those, those that took place elsewhere, I quote, we have learned that in Hungary, wonderful miracles, mostly raising of the dead, took place by a piece of a relic of his holy body that had been placed there, stirring devotion among people." End of quote. Also another miracle reported by Constantine begins with a reference to the spread of the fame of the founder's virtues over the living and the dead in the whole country. Dominic's miracles were also recalled in a sermon composed in all probability by the Provincial of Hungary for a solemn ceremony of the saint's second translation in Bologna in 1267. The sermon is built on the parallel between Joseph in the Old Testament and Saint Dominic, who were both exhumed, exhumed by their sons and brothers and were placed in a new tomb. The preacher ends his sermon by evoking that Joseph and Dominic were alike also in the working of miracles, since not only in Spain or Lombardy, but also in our Hungary, people in large numbers ran to see the miracles performed due to his intercession. If this sermon was in fact delivered with the above content, all those who were present at the translation ceremony in Bologna would hear about the miracles in Hungary and the population's devotion to the saint. Peter of Verona's four miracles were registered by Prior Swipertus in the convent of Sárospatak in 1259 in the account about the hardships and the successes of the Friar's mission in Hungary that he sent to the general master in Bologna. The account can be found in 11 manuscripts of the Liber Vitas Fratrum Predicatorum of Gerard of Prashet, who had access to the materials that were sent to the general master from the different provinces of the order. The Vitas Fratrum was written to be used only within the order, so Peter of Verona's miracles in Hungary could be known only in a few convents. These miracles, with the exception of the first one, are reported extremely briefly without almost any concrete data. The first one reports the healing miracle of Amulia Rutenica, in the background of which also a fortunate missionary activity among the inhabitants is outlined. A Russian woman, the Russians were the followers of Eastern Greek Christianity, probably encouraged by the local Dominicans, looks for healing at the relics of Peter Martyr and regains health. The miracles of Saint Dominic and Saint Peter were success stories communicating the importance of the local Dominican shrines in Hungary towards the whole order. It seems that the two local cults lost importance after that Princess Margaret, the daughter of King Bela IV, died in the fame of sanctity in 1270, and soon a plenty of miracles occurred at the proximity of her tomb on the Dominic, in the Dominican monastery. Margaret was the first Dominican female candidate for sainthood, and although it was King Stephen V, her brother, who informed Pope Gregory X about the miracles, as a result of which the first canonization inquisition took place between 1272 and 76, also the Dominicans in Hungary have contributed greatly to this enterprise. The oldest Vita of Margaret, the so-called Legenda Vetus, was written between 1272 and 75, presumably by her spiritual director and confessor, Marcellus, prior provincial of the Dominicans in Hungary. Most likely, the legend was sent to the Curia together with the Inquisition protoco protocols. I would like to here mention only two instances from the legend to illustrate how it could have contributed to the legitimization of the Dominicans' power. The close connection some priors had with Margaret's parents, the royal couple, can be seen in the detailed presentation of the princess's role as an intermediary in political and family conflicts between her father and her brother that were eventually arranged thanks to her prayers. 
Marcellus also underlines the friar's role in shaping Margaret's sanctity, who adopted what had been revealed to a friar in a dreamlike vision concerning what kind of spiritual perfection the illustrious old fathers possessed. I quote, to love God, to hold oneself in contempt, to have contempt for no one else, to judge no one, end of quote. Living according to this, the king's daughter progressed miraculously in holiness. In the second investigation in 1276, five friars, including Marcellus, were interrogated about her life, behavior, and miracles. These depositions testify their presence in the everyday life of the saintly princess. Three of them experienced her intercessory power, the most remarkable case being that of Brother Jordanus, earlier the confessor of the queen, who kept two pieces of Margaret's relics with the help of which two people were healed on two different occasions. The protocols, including now more than 110 witnesses, were sent to Pope John the 21st. So the veto of Margaret and the two series of canonization protocols were destined to the Curia, which this way was not only informed about all the details of her life and miracles, but could also learn about the part of the friars in leading Margaret on the way of sanctity and also taking care of her saintly fame after her death. In addition to these written official channels to the Holy See, Margaret's reputation as a saint spread in different, less formal ways too among the friars living outside Hungary. To illustrate this with an example, when the general chapter was held in Pest in 1273, Master General John of Vercelli also paid a visit to the monastery where Margaret had lived, and he examined the penitential instruments of the princess. The visit shows that the case of Margaret was not less important for the whole order than from, for the Hungarian royal house, and surely John of Vercelli was not the single Dominican who visited the shrine of the princess during the general chapter. So far we have considered the Dominicans the Dominican saints' miracles and the channels through which the order spread the news about the three local shrines in Hungary. Now let us see what could convince the locals to visit these shrines and take a quick look at some examples, what could have been transmitted about their saints in the friar's preaching. The surviving sources suggest that the Dominicans did not excel in dedicating their churches and altars to their saints. In the 13th century, only one of their churches was dedicated to St. Dominic and three altars to him. None of the Dominican churches was dedicated to St. Peter Martyr. Since Margaret was not canonized, sermons could not be composed for her feast. In turn, two Dominican sermon collections from the last decades of the 13th century, originally made for users in Hungary, report sermons on St. Dominic and Peter of Verona. Even though it is not known how these sermons were actually presented to the audience, at least they give a taste of the Dominican authors why these saints were excellent. The collection of the scholastic sermons, known shortly as the Sermones Compilati, put together and used probably in the Studium Generale in Buddha, around the turn of the 14th century, contain a great number of reflections on preaching. Seven sermons were composed for the Feast of Dominic and five for Peter Martyr. Whereas in Dominic's case, his activity as a preacher is usually combined with learning and teaching, Peter is presented as someone uh, who aimed at the eradication of sin, both moral and theological, by showing the truth. The author brings up several times that in Dominic's glorification, the foundation of the order was decisive. In one of the sermons, he explains how all power was passed from God to people through Christ, from him to the apostles, then to the bishops and the preachers of lower rank. Continuing this thread in another sermon, he writes that Saint Dominic was, I quote, was good and brought fruit for the church of God since he left hairs after himself, and thus the friars of his order are properly called his sons, and all those who, converted, who were converted by the doctrine of his sons are called his grandsons. Peter Martin, whom the author regards to be the first among the preacher friars and special, 
is rather to be admired than imitated. The motive of the triple crown, which was reserved only for those who were martyrs, virgins, and doctors at the same time, turns up in three sermons in connection with Peter. In the sermon built on the theme at Exa Acus Albus, uh, the preachers of Christ, that is the Dominicans, are compared to noble horses that are praiseworthy for the beauty of color by which preachers should be distinguished in leading an exemplary life, for the strength of the body by which they should be strong in virtue while wandering, for the courage of heart by which they should be ardent in the fight against sins and in martyrdom, and for quickness of the legs that they should be ready to be obedient to Christ. The virtues of the preacher friars and those of Peter correspond, so he is presented as a par excellence Dominican friar. On the whole, the friars' efforts in the legitimization of their presence and activity in Hungary towards the local population is not as obvious as it was in the case of the transmission of the information towards the leadership of the order in Italy. Nevertheless, some observations can be made. The Dominicans considered themselves to be the heirs of the apostles, since their main activity was conversion, and they were educated and well-trained for this task, and their learning thus endowed, endowed them with the authority in theological and spiritual matters. In places where the prior, priors possessed relics of their saints, they provided access to them for the faithful. Since miracles indeed occurred in the proximity of the relics, thanks to the intercession of the saints. From the point of view of the local population, the presence of the friars must have been advantageous. Some Dominicans, as we have seen in the case of Margaret, had precious relics at, the, at their disposal to be used for healing purposes. The Dominican saints, in accordance with their profession, could intercede for everyone, regardless of religion or social status. Besides the fact that a female candidate for sainthood, a royal progeny for the merits of whom God performed many miracles, used to be the member of the Dominican family, endowed the order with further prestige. Despite all this, the local cults of the two Dominican saints originating from Italy disappeared in Hungary by the mid-14th century. Only that of Margaret was long-lasting, even without paper recognition. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Esther, for this fine presentation. It is now open for questions and comments. And uh, I would like you to, when you ask the question, to present yourself with name and affiliation. And you need the microphone when you use it. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Robert Wisniewski from the University of Warsaw. And my question goes to Stefan. Uh, the, the, the evidence that you have shown us uh, is, uh, is very interesting because if I were a bishop uh, uh, looking to, uh, well, trying to, to build my episcopal power, uh, what uh, I would need uh, the relics of a preferably holy bishop, martyr, and local. And, but, but, you, but you work with what you have, uh, and uh, well, uh, neither of your, uh, uh, of your heroes uh, was in, a, in, in this comfortable uh, situation. So in, uh, in Lund, they had a holy bishop, but not a local one. Uh, uh, in Odense, they had a martyr, but not really a, a, a bishop. And in Ribe, uh, as far as, under, uh, as I understood, uh, uh, the hero became a bishop only at a uh, uh, certain, uh, certain point. So uh, uh, my, uh, I have uh, actually two questions. First, uh, whether it really mattered what was at the, uh, at the beginning, whether uh, uh, my thinking or our thinking that the St. Peter situation is uh, uh, ideal. I mean, the same situation that we can see in uh, Arles with St. Trophimus, in uh, Toulouse with St. Saturninus, and so on and so on, uh, is, uh, really puts a bishop in a more comfortable uh, situation or not. Uh, and the, the, the other question is uh, whether the strateg strategies of uh, other bishops that you uh, didn't list uh, differed from the ones that you have uh, quoted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just 
students. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, I think that's, um, uh, it, it is a very, those are two very difficult and also very good questions. And I, I'm, I'm, I will try to answer both of them with, with an example from Roskilde, uh, where they, in the, at the end of the 11th century, uh, at, at least uh, according to the sources that we have, the sources are a bit dodgy, um, they, or the, or, well, they, the bishop, uh, imported the, uh, a relic of Pope Lucius from, uh, from Rome uh, into, into Roskilde, and that cult uh, at least was in place uh, by the 12th century, and, and uh, it, uh, it, it shows up in, in some later um, wall paintings from, from Ro Roskilde Cathedral. Now, I think that case is, is one example of how you negotiate the lack of a local saint that is, uh, and uh, at least the lack of a bishop saint, while also trying to um, find some point of reference that, um, that is a, a bishop saint, even though it's not a local one, but you create a new center for that, uh, or a new focal point for that cult in, in Roskilde by, by importing the saint. Because I, I think this idea that, that um, what you ideally want in order to legitimize Episcopal authority is an Episcopal saint. So the case of Roskilde is, is one where you see as the strategy for um, legitimizing authority might be said to import relics, not just the, the cult itself as in Lund with, with the liturgy of St. Thomas, but indeed um, a, a piece of, of the saint uh, himself. So I, I think that absolutely ties into your, your first question concerning the ideal uh, same type to have if you want to, to uh, um, if you want to legitimize Episcopal authority or if you want to emphasize uh, Episcopal legitimacy uh, and I think there was a sort of awareness with that but as, as you say not, always, not, not all the bishops were in, in a position where they could pick and choose so in the case of, of Roskilde where there were no local saints at the time they went abroad and, and uh, got a new one or an old one. Um, and that is simply, I, I think that is a response to a, uh, a specific situation. They didn't have any locally sourced saints, so they, they needed to go abroad. But uh, that also allowed them to choose the best one, i.e. another bishop to, to uh, strengthen the, the uh, Episcopal authority. Um, I hope that answers the question. There are other examples from, from Denmark, but I think that is the one that is that best illustrates what, which is, uh, what, what you suggest. And I, I think you are exactly right in, in making that point that if you are a bishop, a bishop saint is, is the best one, the best to have. We have one, more, one question online before I give you the floor to you, Sarah. Thank you. Here's David uh, from Bernal Masaryk University. I have also a question on Stephen or one remark and one question. Uh, why do you mention that the translation of Ljuvdak by Radulf was unauthorized? Because Radulf was a bishop and as a bishop, he was perfectly, uh, uh, it was perfectly legal to do a translation since the Carinthian times it was before the fourth Lateran. Uh, uh, and second is uh, a question related to the manuscript transmission of those texts that should have uh, supported the, the new cults of science. Uh, are there many or how successful uh, were those bishops with their strategies and um, uh, were those texts uh, copied for a long time or was it just uh, for a decade or a half a century when they were popular? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to, to go for the second uh, question first, the, neither of these cases are particularly successful in a way. Um, in Odense, the cult of Knut uh, starts to lose 
foretold in the rest of Denmark by, by the beginning of the 1130s. Uh, in the case of Ribe, the church burns down in about, uh, about 15 years after the translation, or, or maybe less. Uh, and the later chronicle uh, from, the 12th, from the 13th century says that this is uh, God's punishment for not um, uh, for, for, uh, for the bishop, uh, or because the bishop did not uh, get the sufficient authority to perform this translation. He, he went rogue and, and did it himself without the, um, without the authority of his metropolitan. So, so that, was, that was not successful in, in the long run, but because Radov died before the church burned down, uh, in, in Radov's view, he was probably very successful. Um, in Lund, we, we don't really see, um, well, the, the cult of St. Thomas is, is successful in the sense that it, it remains important. The, the image I showed from the 1517 uh, breviary uh, shows some, some um, handwritten notations on the, on the, in the margins, which shows that in the, even in the 15, uh, 1500s, there was some engagement with the, with the cult. There was, there was something uh, being done with it. The notes haven't been, been transcribed yet, so I, I don't know exactly what. Um, but in, in that sense, it was successful, but it was not, um, it did not need to become, or, or to be used as this sort of um, weapon of authority that, that perhaps was the reason why it was, it, it, the cult was brought to Lund in the first place. Uh, so, and, th and this is also something that is very difficult to, to assess when, when we look at it in hindsight, when we know how it turned out, we know how successful or unsuccessful something was. This does not necessarily mean that it was not an immediate success or that it, it didn't um, do the thing that it was supposed to do. It might have, it might have uh, yielded the expected results, but I don't think necessarily that, that the results were expected to last that long always. Uh, I, I think that was the ideal, but I, I don't think, um, I think there was long-term and short-term success, and in some terms, the short-term success is perhaps most immediate and, and uh, the one that is most decided. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the first question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it was not, not a question, it was just a comment or, well, kind of question. Uh, why do you think that the translation of uh, Ljusdak by Radulf was unauthorized? Because uh, if I understood you correctly, Radulf was a local bishop, so mm, he was perfectly right to do so. Because we are before Fourth Lateran and he did not need any approval from higher authority to do so. <clears throat> Ah, yes. Um, well, according to the later chronicle, the, the lack of authority was that, that he hadn't asked permission from the archbishop, but we don't really know um, whether that was required in the mid-12th century or whether that is a 13th century transposition uh, back in time to um, uh, with, with, where 13th century standards are, are transposed onto, onto the 12th century. So we don't really know that. This is a... I mean, the whole reason why we have that judgment is that the church burned down. If the church had been had not burned and the relics were not incinerated to ashes, um, the judgment might have been very different. But uh, so it's 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 again a case of our sources allow us only to say so much. So I, I'm afraid I don't know um, beyond that. But thank you. Okay. Yeah. I uh, thank you both for. Really interesting papers. I have a question for, for both of you, both Esther and, and Stefan. Esther, it might, I might have just missed it, but I was interested in the sermons about Margaret. Is she used in the same way as, um, as Peter and, and Dominic later on when she becomes more popular in, in Hungary in terms of sermons and, and exemplar? Um, of course, they are more important in the, in the Dominican collections of sermons. Unfortunately, we do not really have other sermons than uh, the Dominican sermons from, from that time. And uh, in these, they indeed have a privileged role. But uh, for instance, also other saints um, who, who were considered as Hungarian saints 
uh, are almost as important as St. Dominic and St. Peter. For instance, uh, St. Elizabeth of Hungary has at least six sermons in this collection. Um, in, the other, in another sermon collection, I didn't uh, have the, the, the time to, to speak about. Um, there are a lot of um, sermons which, are, which were not produced in Hungary, but somewhere near Paris. Uh, and it is not known exactly how they arrived to Hungary, but um, these are concentrating on the on the two recently canonized saints. So, but I, I cannot say that these saints uh, in the 13th century were more important than uh, all the other saints, uh, with the exception of these two places I have thought about. Thank you. Uh, and I had, a, I had one for Stefan okay. as well. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I might actually be able to sort of answer David's question, or David's question, sorry, because I've actually written about uh, the Danish uh, saints and, and that. It, they seem to be, um, that story might have been written into uh, uh, the uh, Lufdijk's story later about, about it being an illegitimate um, translation of relics because the Danish bishops seem to look, as Stefan said, to the Metropolitan See to, to Lund, and it's the attempt to centralize in Denmark, as well as always needing papal authority for the cults of the saints in Denmark. So that could be one of the reasons. But again, it, it seems to be a later addition, um, and that Radov himself wasn't actually considered to be illegitimate at the time before Lauren IV, of course. Um, Stefan, the question, that was the comment. Um, the question is about Lund and why not a Danish saint. Now, I've written about this as well, but I just wanted to know <laughs> your take. I mean, we've talked about this before, but Absalom, why not Absalom? Why Thomas? Like, mm. Why not somebody local for, mm. for Lund? Um, Tom. Oh, that, that is a great question. Um, well, trying to think like an arch archbishop here. Um, I think it has to do with the sheer force of Thomas's popularity, that he was such, um, an emotive figure in a way. He, he had performed the ultimate sacrifice uh, for the sake of the church. So if you want to have an authority figure that represents the church, he was the one to go to. Uh, and I think also perhaps um, if this happened in the, um, uh, in the reign of Eskil, I think he felt perhaps more strongly connected to, to him. Uh, because they had shared some of the same experiences. They had both quarreled with the kings and gone into exile. So I, I, think, it's, I think it has to do with, with the, uh, I think it is a testament to the, the um, immense popularity of Thomas and that that could overshadow all the problems of, of local versus uni universal. And um, I, I think he just became universal in such a, a, a brief time that he, he, was, uh, he was the best option to, to go for when, when he wanted to uh, strengthen ecclesiastical authority, I, I think. Thank you. I have Haki and Grecos on my list. Haki first. Uh, Haki from uh, University College London. Um, the question to Stefan about uh, where, where do you see the kind of the royal power coming into the cult, both of these cults actually, um, with Knut, you have this supposed papal canonization that Eric Eagle may have had a hand in uh, securing, and at the same time, he's also securing the, the new archbishopric. So where, where, where do you see the, the, the royal authority coming into this cult in the early stages? And secondly, I was wondering if the, the, the royal authority, the king, did something to claim Thomas Beckett as well, because there's, a, there's this fantastic miracle in one, in one of uh, Thomas's uh, miracle collections where, where uh, Thomas kind of appears to the king, I can't remember, it's Knut or Ultimate in a dream, and kind of uh, tells him to go on a crusade against the, in the Baltic. So I wonder, so in both cases, where, where do you see the kind of the royal authority coming into? How does it play off against the, the, the I guess, the ecclesiastical side? Thank you. <clears throat> oh, well, that, that is... Those are very difficult questions, um, and I, mm, I, I hesitate to, to answer, but I, I think there might be some attraction to, to this, um, let's say, the royal dimension 
of, of these gods. I mean, Knut is, is a royal. Uh, Thomas commanded a royal in, in his miracles or in, in, his, in the king's dreams. And I, I think maybe, I hadn't thought of that, but I, it, it might be that that is part of what makes these saints so applicable um, in, in order to um, strengthen the, the uh, Episcopal authority. Because it's, I, in, in my talk I used authority and power a bit interchangeably, which I now regret. Um, b because power is, is um, well, power comes in many forms, but very often it is, it is um, understood as, as the potential to use, or the, the ability to use force. And I, of course, the church didn't have that as, as much. And if there was any force uh, that could be wielded by the Danish church, it had to be through the, the uh, secular uh, powers, or especially the royal powers. So I, th I think there might be some element to, to, um, to that dependency, which was very strong, especially during the time of Knut, that um, the, by having a, a royal saint, in the case of Knut, or having a saint, as in the case of Thomas, that, that sort of lorded it over the king, I think that might also show uh, the, the uh, at least in case of, of Thomas, it, it showed the primacy of the church uh, against the royal power, that the royal power should be the arm of the church and not the other way around. Of course, that is a bit, that idea is a bit too, I'm, I'm not sure if that came into place with, with Knut, but because it's a bit early. Uh, but there, of course, you have to consider the, the uh, controversy concerning the tithes that was, um, introduced into Denmark around that time in the first decades of the 12th century, um, which was one of the major challenges to Epis Episcopal authority because the, uh, the secular lords did not want to give up the, the privileges that would be replaced by, by the tithes. So I think maybe having a royal saint in that case um, would alleviate some of that controversy, alleviate some of the, the uh, resistance, as it were. Uh, so I, I think that could also go some way to explain how uh, cults with this, with this royal connection, as it were, uh, also became very useful and, and very, um, and, and very uh, applicable in that sense. I'm not sure if I've answered the questions as well as I should, so feel free to... to uh, okay. Because of the microphone issue, we cannot actually take the discussion like this. I'll just now, Greg, you have the last question. All right, I will, I will try. Uh, I, I have actually questions and comments to both papers. And uh, first, uh, first, you, you have mentioned the case of Lund because we are talking about uh, Thomas Beckett. You, you have mentioned that one of the reasons to introduce, uh, introduce the cult was the conflict between the archbishop and the king. So, so my question would be, if that's possible, that that was the reason to introduce Thomas Beckett, not somebody else. And there is an anal analogy for that in, in, in Polish ma material. In the 1280s, there was a very, very violent conflict between uh, Silesian Duke uh, Henry and, and uh, Bishop Thomas. And so Thomas was sieged in the, in the castle of Ratibusz. And just after the reconciliation, the chapel was consecrated in, the, in, in this very castle and the patrocinium of the chapel was Thomas Beckett. So obviously there was a reason for, for that, that it was not, not accidental um, patrocinium for such a chapel. Uh, and if, if I can just have a comment, maybe you would like to respond to that to, 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 to Esther. I just, just wanted to say that from the perspective of somebody who's working on the earlier period, your paper shows very well how great change was the presence of the, of the, of the mendicant order because uh, it seems to me from your paper that, in fact, uh, um, the locality didn't matter at all uh, in, the, in the question of the cult of saints. So you can use the foreign saints, which are Dominicans, to legitimize the presence of Dominicans in Hungary. And then a local um, Hungarian saint, St. Margaret, is not less important elsewhere in the order, of course, than in, in Hungary. Um, and just be we don't have a time just to, to, to respond to what, what David said about the the, the canonization papal authority, because I'm working on that. It's not so easy to say that in 12th century, single bishop can make a canonization without papal approval. There are so many opini opinions about that, and, and David, you, you should remember that in the third quarter of 12th century, Cosmas of Prague was 
pretty sure that without papal authority, you are not allowed to do that. It's quite early, but, but he, he has written that. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Um, no, uh, so, hang on. But could, could you um, repeat the question? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Don't you think that the, the reason why the Thomas Beckett was, was chosen in Lund was simply that it is in the situation of the conflict between Archbishop and the king, which, you know, remind very well the situation, the historical situation between Thomas Beckett and, uh, and the English king? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, again, apologies. I, I think absolutely that is one of the, the uh, primary parts of it, yes. That, that, was, that, that fit the situation that Eskil had gone through, and it, it, uh, it mirrored the, the situation that Eskil perhaps feared would, would um, appear again when, when there was a new archbishop and, uh, and if the king decided to go back on, on his support of the archbishop. So, yes, I, I think it's, um, it, it fit very well with... with um, with the lines of the conflict, it, it was the perhaps the ideal choice for for that reason. So ab absolutely. Okay, thank you. We can now we are now coming to the end of this first session, and I would like to thank both speakers for very fine presentations. <laughs> and uh, we now have a 15 minutes coffee break. make a very short practical announcement. So we have even more than, than 15 minutes. We are meeting here back 10 to 11. Just to, to the presenters, you can also present from here and using this remote controller to make a presentation if you, if you prefer that. And quite important information, there are um, one toilet available on this floor, um, opposite to the front, uh, front door is gender neutral toilet. There are also, the ladies room is the first floor and the, the men's toilet in the third, uh, third floor. Uh, they are signed by the quite old fashioned sign typical for Germany and East Central Europe that is double O without seven. And please enjoy, of course, coffee, tea, biscuits.
So, so if you want to have enough time for a lunch later, we should start. So, um, welcome back to, um, to the next session, and we will start off with Haraldur Rensson. Um, and uh, the floor is yours. Seems like everything is working. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I want to also express my thanks for the invitation to this conference. It's quite. Yeah. And also in this uh, beautiful um, venue, it's quite impressive. Um, but I will just begin and uh, begin by saying that in this paper, I will be discussing the socio-political and socio-religious landscape in medieval Iceland with a particular emphasis on religious discourses related to the apostles and their importance for the development of ecclesiastical elite in the country. A more precise title and, uh, would have been Hagiographic Works Related to the Apostles and Ecclesiastical Elites in Medieval Iceland, but I decided to stay with this shorter one. Uh, with a chronological focus on the 12th century, I will be arguing that uh, religious discourses on the apostles, as they can be found in hagiographical texts, provided an important discursive uh, backdrop for the shifts which occurred in the composition of the ecclesiastical elites uh, with the advent of the Gregorian reform in Iceland in the last quarter of the 12th century. Until then, an important part of the ecclesiastical elite had consistent, cons consisted of ordained chieftains who had promoted the growth of the Christian religion in Iceland through various means. In the process of, the, of reform, the chieftains came to be distanced and excluded from the ecclesiastical elite in Iceland, which in turn became more homogenized. Um, my talk, uh, uh, my presentation will be divided into three parts. In the first one, I will quickly place my discussion in the historiography of the church in medieval Iceland and introduce terms important for the discussion. In the second part, uh, I will introduce the hagiographic source material and explain how it can be perceived as fraught with socio-political weight. And in the third part, I will provide some historical context and explain the ambiguous role of these discourses, the, the, these religious discourses related to the apostles in the confrontation between church and chieftains in the last quarter, quarter of the 12th century. Um, yeah. So uh, let's begin with some historiographical background. Uh, this is important because for long, scholarship of the Christian religion and the church in medieval Iceland was not very interested in religion as such. Um, it was much rather preoccupied with the administration of the church, its organization, its relationship to the political system and finances. Uh, the content of the religion has not enjoyed much attention by historians, although that has been changing in recent years and decades. Um, yeah, so this is the tendency that I'm reacting 
uh, reacting to. Uh, those familiar with the historiog historiography of the church in Iceland during the first two centuries after the formal introduction of Christianity uh, in the year 1000 know that a central figure in how that story has been written was that of the chieftain. The chieftains were the most influential men in the country with power over men and land. Their power ex extended itself also to the church, but since the beginning of Christianity, the chieftains had a major influence on how the new religion came to be organized in the country. <coughs> Sorry. They built and owned churches, and in the 12th century, there was a church on practically every residence of a chieftain. Gradually, uh, they gained control over other churches within the parameters of uh, the version of the proprietary church system, which was in effect in the country. The chieftains were also in control over who would receive nomination as bishops at the two episcopal seats in the country, and as a rule, the bishops came from the chieftains' families. And to further add to the influence of the chieftains in the church in Iceland, they were also ordained priests. Not all of them, but quite many. It has been customary in the historiography of medieval Iceland to speak of chieftain priests who were running their own type of chieftain church in something which has also been termed chieftain church supremacy. For those familiar with the Icelandic terminology, terminology I am speaking of kirkju godar, goða kirkja, and kirkju goða veldi. Uh, previous scholarship has dealt extensively with the question as to why the chieftains were willing to involve themselves so thoroughly in the operation of the new religion. Time and again, scholars have shown how the chieftains managed to increase their social, political, and economic capital through such involvement. The Christian religion and the church were tools to reach such ends. It is very rarely assumed that the Christian religion might have appealed to them on religious grounds, at least not explicitly. Um, in my doctoral dissertation, which was published earlier this year, and uh, much of what I am saying here is based on that research, um, yeah, so in this book I have expressed skepticism towards the social and political reductionism of the Christian religion in the history writing of medieval Iceland, and have tried to take seriously the potential of the content of the religion as one factor amongst others for explaining uh, the developments taking place in the country. One part of that is to think of the chieftains as authentically religious men, practicing Christians who were well versed in the content of the Christian religion as it manifested itself in 11th and 12th century Iceland. And now to quickly address the concept of elites, uh, as my discussion so far has suggested, the ecclesiastical elites in Iceland, and by that I am primarily referring to bishops and influential priests, overlapped significantly with the political elite in the country. And I should mention that in my original paper proposal for this conference, I was going to speak about bishops and priests as such and the legitimation of their power through hagiography on the apostles. But for some reason, the chieftains did not let go of me this time. And I will anyways be playing with the idea that the chieftains were as priests making use of comparable legitimation strategies for their power. Let's see how it works out. But so, the ecclesiastical elite was therefore not only consisting of men who had solely devoted themselves to the church, it has also included chieftains who, in addition to their religious authority, had a great deal of secular power, if such a differentiation is in general applicable for the socio-religious context of 11th and 12th, 12th century Iceland. In that sense, it could be described as diverse. Towards the end of the 12th century, however, this was bound to change. Um, but before we address these changes, let me introduce some of the sources we have for how the Christian religion as it was being presented to the people living in Iceland in the 11th, 12th and 13th century. Uh, yeah, how, how, the, how the Christian religion uh, was being presented to the people living in Iceland in the 11th, 12th and 13th century. The religious sources preserved are diverse and were circulating in both Latin and Old Icelandic from an early stage in the Christianization process. Prominent amongst them are hagiographic texts, and in this presentation, I'll be focusing on material about the apostles preserved in Old Icelandic translations. 
And uh, on this slide, I'm just giving a few examples of which text I'm talking about. These are, like I say, translations and are mostly compilations of biblical material, early Christian apocryphal acts of the apostles, and medieval texts on the apostles, which are in current scholarship collectively, co <coughs> collectively referred to as the Virtutes Apostolorum, but were for long known as the pseudo abdian accounts of the apostles. And uh, on, on this slide, um, I'm simply showing a statue of the Apostle Andrew. Only the cross is missing, uh, I have put it there on the slide, uh, to give an insight into the preserved material world of medieval Christianity in Iceland, uh, which is quite limited uh, from this time. Um, <clears throat> I will not be discussing cults of individual apostles, but looking at the texts, uh, these texts um, uh, which I referred to uh, and other similar, um, I will be looking at these texts uh, within uh, the cult of the saints in Iceland as sources for a consistent religious discourse which was produced and diffused around the country. In a country like Iceland, where Christianity was still relatively young, such texts were very important for the growth of the religion. It was through encounters with the discourses contained in and derived from such texts within, but also outside the framework of the cult of the saints, that people would be introduced to the main tenets of the Christian religion. And uh, just to clearly link this to what I said earlier about the religiosity of the chieftains and other medieval Icelanders, if we assume that they were authentically Christian, which we should absolutely do, uh, these are the sources which provide access to the content of what they believed. The modern reception of these sources has been marked by the fact that these are translations and not as interesting to many as original works. They have also been described by serious scholars as repetitive and tedious, uh, which they may well be. But that prob uh, probably means that it was more likely that their message got through. Scholars of medieval culture have tended to restrict their audience to ecclesiastics, but I have argued for a much broader audience. They were also produced in such masses that they were bound to reach more people than, uh, <coughs> for example, any work of saga literature. Content-wise, these texts are fraught with socio-political weight. To save time, I will not be providing much textual evidence in this part or the next, but let me instead refer to the thematic analysis from my book and references there. I hope you can see this. Um, on this slide, I am simply showing part of the table of contents of the, of the book to give an overview of how I organize the material with regard to its um, socio-political potential. But to take an example which is important for the argument of this paper, they can be seen as constructing a certain type of authority, that is, apostolic authority, which by extension could be applied to the authority of the representatives of the Christian religion, its ordained servants, as well as the Roman church as an institution. The authority of the apostles not only consists in how they are represented as fearless emissaries of God who enter every situation with the purpose of conquering any opposition, either through conversion or other less peaceful methods, their authority is legitimated through their special relationship to the divine and with reference to a particular religious doctrine in Icelandic kenning, which can be traced to the teacher of the apostles, Christ himself. Directly linked to this notion of authority is the treatment of those who do not accept this authority or disregard it and the consequences of such opposition. Here I have put on a slide a manifestation of the retributive discourses um, inherent to the Christian religion as it was being presented in Iceland uh, in the 11th and 12th centuries. Amongst the few material remains preserved from 11th century Iceland are these wooden panels believed to have originally been part of a large illustration in a Byzantine spirit depicting the Day of Judgment. By showing this, uh, I am emphasizing that I am not arguing for the importance of the hagiographic texts on the apostles uh, in isolation, but as part of the entire religious spectacle of the church, which greatly impacted medieval Icelandic society, a society which has sometimes been described as more secular than it was. 
In the last part of this paper, I will try to explain in more detail how I think this impact can be described in the context of the changes uh, in the 12th century. And now, coming to the third part of this presentation, we return to the figure of the chieftain and their position with it within the church in medieval Iceland and the changes that happened in that regard during the 12th century. I have already mentioned that chieftains who had devoted themselves to the church have to, begin, have to be taken seriously as believing Christians who were familiar with the content of texts such as uh, the hagiographical writings of, uh, on the apostles and were in all likelihood also reproducing the discourses on authority, the enemies of the church, and the retributive structures which can be found in such texts. In medieval, in medieval sources, one encounters chieftains who are described as having not only read, read stories of apostles and other, other saints for religious reasons, but also as evening entertainment. But despite such an emphasis on the relig religiosity of the chieftains, it should also be kept in mind that they were, of course, also the most powerful men in the country, with much influence over the non-ecclesiastical sphere of society, as they participated in the wheeling and dealing of Icelandic society, for example, through their roles in the legislative and judicial system of the country and mediators in conflict. And even though the chieftains did not adopt the Christian relig religion in order to increase their authority in the non-ecclesiastical realm of society, it is correct, as scholars have pointed out, it did contribute to their authority and added to their glory. We do not know how exactly ordained chieftains understood their power as regards any differentiation between religious and secular spheres. We also don't know if it was understood very exactly. We should, for example, be very careful, careful of applying notions of Christian kingship to the power of the Christian chieftain in Iceland. One historian of medieval Iceland has stated that, uh, and I quote, the division between religious and secular power was vague. And in her massive book on the proprietary church system in the medieval West, Susan Wood states that ambiguity, fuzziness, and even paradox may bring us closer to the proprietary church than logic or legal analysis." End of quote. And on a similar note, in a discussion of the relationship between church and king in the early Middle Ages, Gerd Althoff emphasizes the importance of an indif indifference towards uh, ambiguity, ambiguitets indifference, uh, by which he means the unclarity and plural plurality of meaning with which central principles, customs, and rules were treated in this period. Um, perhaps it is best to approach any clarification of the power of the ordained chieftains from such a vantage point. What is clear, however, is that there were discourses being produced and reproduced where this relationship was quite clear, namely as they appear, appear in hagiographic texts, such as those related to the apostles and I've already introduced. The conceptualization was not necessarily very elaborate. On the contrary, it was relatively simple, but clear they were. They make an uncompromising claim for the authority, ultimate authority of the representatives of the Christian religion and the church as an institution. The apostles are introduced as figures of supreme authority, dominating every situation they enter. They meet every act of resistance, boosting with confidence, certain that whatever will happen, they will end up victorious. And so they did, even if they were executed. Only then their victory would be called a victory in torture, pinningar sigur, in Old Icelandic. We know for certain that ordained chieftains knew such discourse as well, and as ordained priests, they had a justified claim to such authority. In the last quarter or so of the 12th century, the situation began to change. A shift began to occur in Icelandic church politics as ideas inspired by the Gregorian reform reached Icelandic shores. The office of the Archbishop of Nidaros in Norway was introduced in a series of letters from the Archbishop Eystein Erlendsson and Erikur Ivarsson as an authority demanding obedience. These letters were sent in support of local bishops of Skálholt, Þorlákur Þórhallsson, who seems to have been the first to consciously advocate for the libertas of the church and against the chieftain church supremacy, although the details of his demands remain debated. 
What is clear, however, is that after these skirmishes, at the end of the 12th century, the participation of chieftains in the church and as part of the ecclesiastical elite had suffered quite some restrictions. The topic of the ownership of churches by chieftains had been problematized, there had been a demand for a moral reform amongst the chieftains, and those in possession of the greatest power, that is those who owned a chieftaincy, um, a godord, were not allowed to receive ordination. What I want to emphasize is that the shift which was taking place there, beginning in the late 1170s, should not only be described as a church political shift coming from above and out of the distance. It was, and no less, imp less importantly, a hermeneutic shift. And this hermeneutic shift was grounded in a discursive landscape which had come into being through the textual production of the church, for example, hagiographic texts rela relating to the apostles. In their letters, the archbishops not only introduced their demands, but a particular hermeneutic framework for understanding the discourse of the Christian religion as it was being presented in medieval Iceland. This hermeneutic framework was, of course, largely shaped by themes and rhetoric which had been part of the church reform from the beginning and one encounters already in writings from Pope Leo IX and Gregory VII. Uh, here I'm thinking of, of apostolic authority, primatus petri, demand for obedience. What these letters also contain is a particular construction of the other, the enemies of the church, who are described as arrogant, full of superbia, that is, stubborn and stuck in ancient customs, firmska. Those who are described in such a way in the old Icelandic hagiography on the apostles are arch heretics like Simon Magus and cruel emperors like Nero. In the letters of the archbishops, it is the Icelandic chieftains. Some of them are named in the letters, as you can see on the slide, as well as some information about the nature of the relationship. I'm almost done of the relationship to the church, which was oftentimes quite strong. The hermeneutic shift directed the spotlight to themes in the religious discourse, which were bound to specify the nature of the power that the chieftains had been enjoying as ordained servants of the church. This component of the Archbishop's message should not be underestimated, and I assume that Bishop Thorlaugur was arguing along the same, same lines. Just to take one example, in a letter from 1180 from Archbishop Eistedt to the Icelandic chieftains, he begins by acknowledging the great power over the people in Iceland, which had been given to the chieftains by God. What he also seems to be claiming is that they do not have a proper understanding of this power and that they should be corrected by the wise men on the island who had knowledge of the law of God. And now coming to an end, through the call to obedience and the hereticizing of the disobedient, which was granted in religious discourse, produced, maybe it must produce, it must diffuse, um, uh, through the production of texts, such as the apostolic hagiography, the chieftains were forced to acknowledge that their rank in this hierarchy was not necessarily comparable to the social hierarchies of their beloved uh, subarctic commonwealth. They were being convinced with the religious arguments, reasoning and power structures, which they knew well from such writings. Things would probably have played out differently if the only arguments acceptable to them were grounded in real politic and economic gain. Not without pushback or conflict, it gradually dawned upon the chieftains that they could not continue in the same way as before. They would still maintain quite some influence in the church, which is another discussion, but not anymore as part of the ecclesiastical elite in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now it's time for our second speaker. Great so much. Now it's time for our second speaker. Gregor. Thank you very much. So my, my paper is entitled The uh, Nunnery and its Patroness entitled Mua Legitimization and Mutual Support. Um, I don't have a presentation, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I have to um, confess that uh, now I'm pretty sure that one shouldn't give a paper on the conference he, he organized, <laughs> um, but, but let me start. So, uh, St. Ludmila, the wife of the first Christian ruler of Bohemia, was murdered in 921 on the orders of her godless daughter-in-law. She was 
grandmother of St. Wenceslas, whose martyrdom at the hands of his brother, Boleslav I, I know what the family, um, took place about 15 years later and whose cult was developing rapidly already at the turns, uh, turn of uh, 1960s and 1970s. The beginning of St. Ludmila's cult seemed to be more modest and gave rise uh, to many more controversies between scholars. In brief, it was discussed whether she received a wider veneration and was accepted as a saint by the local church already in the end of 10th century or as, less, uh, as late as the mid 12th century. My view in this controversy is that we have enough arguments not to be discussed here in land to be sure that the cult is to be noted already in the 10th century and existed even if without important growth during the next decades and centuries. It was undoubtedly centered in St. George Abbey in the Prague Castle Hill, which housed the saint's body. There is no reason, however, to think, as some skeptics suggest, or in fact one skeptic now suggests, uh, that it did not extend well beyond its walls. The body of St. Ludmila was transferred to St. George the Church in Prague by her grandson, St. Wenceslas. At this stage, however, it was not a saint's translation yet, but rather a transfer of the judge's body to the church established by the in the Przemyślitz center of the power by Ludmila's own son, Duke Bratislav I, who also rested there. St. George, already in this time, being probably a collegiate church, played a central role on the Prague Castle Hill, also after the foundation of the Rotunda of St. Vitus by Duke Wenceslas. Both churches received, however, new functions after the establishment of the new bishopric in 968-976 in Prague, which belonged until then to the Regensburg diocese. The key role in the creation of the new diocese was played by Mlada, daughter of Boleslav I, who traveled to Rome when she became a Benedictine nun and received a new monastic name, Mary. According to the papal document quoted by Cosmas, so the, 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 the Bohemian chronicler from the first quarter of, of 12th century, whose authenticity, the authenticity is however disputable, the Pope gives his approval for the bishopric to be founded in the Bohemian capital and for the community of nuns, quote, to be established at the church of St. George the Martyr under the rule of St. Benedict and in, in the obedience of our daughter, Abbess Mary, unquote. The letter immediately spurred the Duke and his sister into action. The church of St. Vitus was to be seat of the future bishop, while the church of St. George of a nunnery. The sole fact of establishing the nunnery with papal approval, alongside with the diocese and under the leadership of the ruler's daughter, shows the great prestige of, this in, in, of the institution. The nunnery was also, which should be stressed here, a dynastic foundation, modeled on well-known example from the contemporary Reich. Established and led by the ruling family members, it, played for the, it prayed for the pro, uh, prosperity and salvation of the Przemyslitz dynasty. However, the special symbolic function of St. George was related not only with the monastery, but also marked with other factors. First of all, the church itself was, as mentioned before, also established by the dynasty member, and namely Duke of Bratislav, the first father of Wenceslas, and from his time it housed the graves of many Przemyslitz, apart from Ludmila and Blada, also the graves of the church, fun church founder, as well as that of Dukes Boleslav II, Jaromir, and finally Oldrich, who died in 1034. Those are all Bohemian rulers until, the time, um, uh, until that time, whose burial place is to be ad identified apart from San Wenceslau. Wenceslas, so the church should be treated as the, as the first necropolis of the Przemyslitz. Obviously, the Prague Castle Hill, uh, where the church was located, reminded an important center of power in itself. But some scholars suggest that the function of dynastic sepulchre was accompanied, which was quite common in this period, by the special role played by the church in the rituals of the ducal power inaugurations. The stone throne called Gigi, on which each new duke was solemnly seated, was situated between the St. George Church and the cathedral. Interestingly, however, according to Cosmas' description of the 1055 inauguration of Duke Spitignev, it was the Church of St. George where the duke directed his step just after enthronement, which leads Roderick Schmidt to the conclusion that it was there that the inaugural mass was celebrated. The symbolic rule of 
um, of St. George Church, as well as the glorious beginning of the dynastic nunnery, correlated with the real power of its abbesses. We cannot say a lot it's, uh, about its economical status, but our sources tell us something about its political position, giving us a few stories which suggest that the abbeys were mightly enough not to hesitate to oppose the most powerful figures. Let me mention here only one anecdote, partly humorous, given by Cosmas again, about the conflict between one of the St. George's abbeys and the throne heir, Spitignev. When he was supervising at the order of his father the construction of the new wall around the Burg of Prague, it turned out that the work could not be done without destroying Abbe's oven. When others hesitated to do so, Spitignev tore it down, saying, quote, the Lady Abbess will not enjoy hot cakes today, unquote. The furious Abbess confounded the prince, derailing his, quote, famous triumph over the oven. Sometime later, during the already mentioned enthronement, Spitignev, who, quote, kept the walls of the abbess deep in his heart, unquote, took his revenge and banished the abbess. Although, no old, although not all details of this humorous story should be taken as a description of actual events, it seems that it relates to some conflict between the throne heir and the abbess. Even if finally the latter lost, the whole story shown, shows that, at least according to Cosmas, the, the position of the St. George Nunnery's abbesses uh, was powerful enough to make this kind of confrontation with the member of the ruling di dynasty possible. I am stressing the strong position of St. George to show it as a place with the potential to create a new cult, which would be a symbolic manifestation of its institutional power and identity. Indeed, according to most scholars, it was just after the foundation of the nunnery and by the powerful Princess Mlada and her relatives that the remains of St. Ludmila were transferred to the cross-shaped repository located in the central nave of the church. What is important, analogies from the Reich and elsewhere suggest that this kind of repo repository was used exclusively for relics. In other words, we are dealing with the first material sign of, of St. Ludmila's veneration. Interestingly, the repository was partly destroyed when nearby grave number 98 was dug. Relics of St. Ludmila had to be removed from there before, most likely to an overgrown tumba, known from the description of the church destruction in 1142. Grave number 98 is identified usually as the burial, of, uh, burial place of Boleslav II, who died in 999, or sometimes alternatively of Boleslav I, who died in 972. It seems then, therefore that the eleva elevatio of Ludmila, which was an official recognition of her cult, happened already in 10th century, that is no longer than three decades after the establishment of the Prague Nunnery. The connection between the institution and the new cult is therefore clear. The promotion of St. Ludmila's cult was probably directly linked with the growing cult of St. Wenceslas, which will be described in details by uh, David tomorrow in the nearby church of St. Vitus. It was already Boleslav I's brother and assassinator of the saint who had his body translated from Stara Boleslav where the martyr was initially buried. The church, now with double patronage, um, was the undoubted center of the cult and it was suggested already by Josef Pekas and developed by Dusan Szeszczyk that the purpose of the recognition of the new saint was to legitimize the creation of the Prague bishopric, which happened according to the latter shortly after the translation. Szeszczyk states, that, he, that the formal recognition of the cult of St. Ludmila in Mladas monastery might have taken place in the same time. It was most likely at that time that the life of St. Ludmila, known as Fruit in Provincia Boemorum, was written. It described the pious life and the saint, of the saints and her death, described in the strictly hagiographical manner, and called a martyrdom. Sometime later, in 990s, another hagiographical piece, The Life of St. Wenceslas and St. Ludmila, no, known as Legenda Christiana, was written. The Vita, describing apart from the life and death of the saint, also the transfer of her body to Prague, as well as celebration of, the, of her feast, it was dedicated to the Bishop of Prague and further martyr Wojtek Adalbert, while its author, according to all probability, was Mlada's own brother, monk Christian. It is Legenda Christiana, which presents very well the ideological meaning of both cults from the, for the Premishlitz. Written by the member of the dynasty itself, it presented an extensive history of Bohemia and ducal lineage, as well as closely linked St. Ludmila with St. Wenceslas, um, uh, whose cult was much more developed in the end of 10th century. In the similar, similar manner, 
the veneration of those two dynastic saints may have been cultivated in two churches closely related with the Przemyślitz, St. Vitus and St. George, and in two institutions founded by them, that is the bishopric and the nunnery. In the following decades, however, the close relations between the dynasty and the nunnery weakened. It is, sometimes, uh, it is sometimes stressed by Czech historians that from the very beginning it was female representatives of the ducal family who often served as the abbeys in St. George. Indeed, in later period we can find evidence of a preference for premised princes, such as the transfer of uh, Vratislav II's do daughter Agnes, who was an abbess at the Doxane Monastery, to St. George's abbess uh, in, 12, uh, in, in, in 1200 or the abdication of Sofia, abbess of, Saint, of the Prague Monastery, in favor of Kunigund of the Przemyśl dynasty in 1302. However, when we take a closer look at the 11th, 12th century, it turned out that we do not know of any female representative of a dynasty being made abbess in this period. The Church of St. George also lost its function as a dynastic necropolis, as after Olgi, who died in 1034, no ruler or other member of the Przemyśl Przemyślis was buried there. Until the end of the 12th century, some were buried in the cathedral, some in Visegrad Collegiate Church, some in other places. A separate issue is that of the Przemyślis being remembered in prayers of St. George's monastery. For, the, for a, a monastery associated with the dynasty, there are surprisingly few names of early Przemyślis in the surviving abbey necro necrologies, which are, however, quite late as they originated in the early 14th century. This loosened bond between the monastery and its founders, uh, and its founders descendants may have uh, induced nuns to stress even more strongly their connection to their patroness and at the same time the mother of the ruling dynasty. Apart from the related prestige, the figure of St. Ludmila reminded also the Przemyślitz about their duties to the nunnery. The story of the conflict between the abbess and Spitignev shows that it was indeed necessary. On the other hand, although there is enough argument to disagree with those who claim that the veneration of St. Ludmila was limited to St. George Abbey, its popularity in 11th and first half of 12th century was, as mentioned at the beginning, rather limited. It is even hard to compare it with the flourish cult of St. Wenceslas, uh, which had also um, an important political significance. Nothing alike happened in the case of St. Ludmila. The explanation of the, of the disproportion between the two dynastic cults might be related with, to the observation of Lars Boyemotelsen, who pointed out that at the early stage of Christianization, in the peripheral, peripheral realms of Latin Christendom, the ideological and religious landscape was always dominated by only one saint. This conclusion, based on the comparison of Norway, Denmark, and Hungary, works also in the case of Bohemia, however, with one important reservation. Even if in Bohemia, uh, Wenceslas' position as patron of political community remained unshaken, from the second half of the 11th century, the status of additional patron of the realm was taken by St. Adalbert, who also became a third patron of the Prague Cathedral. This was a consequence of the translation of his body to Prague from Gniezno by the Bohemian, um, by the Bohemian army during the right to then collapsing Poland in late 1030s. The well-established cult of former Bishop of Prague and Martyr was adapted very quickly. It is therefore quite likely that the slowdown of the development of St. Ludmila's cult was the effect of the coincidence that is the translation of St. Adalbert, whose veneration uh, showed that the, uh, uh, whose veneration shadowed, sorry, that of the Holy Przemyślit Duchess. <clears throat> As the monastery of St. George needed Ludmila Scott for legitimation purposes, especially to stress the, its bond with the, uh, with the dynasty, in the 11th and first half of 12th century, it was also the opposite. St. Ludmila needed the active support of her weakened cult. Our souls, Sources tells us of two events presenting such support by nuns of uh, Prague Abbey, which in both cases causes some sort of confrontation with Prague bishops. Cosmas notes under the year 1100 a scene of which he claims to, be, to have been an e witness. During the consecration of the church belonged to, to the nunnery, the abbess Windelmut was uh, supposed to ha have given Bishop Hermann a fragment of clothes taken from St. Ludmila's dress to be placed among other relics in a pyx in, a, in the altar. 
According to the chronicler, the bishop said, quote, be quiet, lady, about her, san about her sanctity. Let the old woman rest in peace, unquote. The scandalized abbess testified that the saint worked miracles, so the bishop ordered the examination of the piece of Ludmilla's clothes by fire. Unsurprisingly, the order approved the sanctity of Ludmilla, the material, the material reminded untouched by fire, where the, where the bishop and accompanying canons shed tears of joy. The story as pointed out by David Kalhaus and developed by myself elsewhere should not be treated literally. It is not, as some Czech historians suggest, the illustration of the ambiguous, if not openly uh, hostile, attitude of the Prague bishops to, to St. Ludmila's cult. Its goal is rather to present the sainthood of the Holy Duchess, which Cosmas apparently accepts without reservation, by employing the figure of the doubting Thomas, a role often played by bishops in other hagiographical stories. From our point of view, it is, however, important to stress that it illustrates also the determination of St. George Abbess to promote the cult by using relic during the consecration of new churches. The second story is to be found in the appendix to the chronicle of so-called Canon of Vyshafrat. In the year 1142, after the siege of Prague by the Moravians, the nuns of the convent of, quote, St. George the Martyr and St. Ludmila the Martyr, unquote, decided to find and remove the relics of the Holy uh, Duchess in the destroyed church. Um, the church, uh, by the way, it is the first text uh, where, where St. Ludmila is mentioned as a, as a patron of the monastery directly. After being miraculously stopped, they ask Bishop of Prague Otto to come and decide what to do. He, however, declines to do anything without first sending for authority from Rome, which is, coming back to our discussion with David, which is rather early example of the acceptance of the papal prerogatives in issues related with the saints' translation. To fulfill their wishes, as Cosmas says, uh, nuns turned then to the Henry's Dick, the Bishop of Olomouc, apparently present in Prague, with whom, as we know from other sources, they were in good relations. Zdik, however, refused to act without the permission of the local bishop. Not giving up, on the advice of Dean Henry, Archdiacon Ar Peter, and other members of the Prague Cathedral chapter, the nuns, quote, took out the casket, opened it, and uh, having viewed it over, uh, joyously laid next to the altar, unquote. The story can be interpreted from many perspectives, but while asking about the involvement of the convent in Ludmilla's cult, um, uh, the most important is probably, again, the determination of the nuns ready to take care for the proper treatment of their patroness relict, even in spite of objection from the Prague bishop invo invoking papal rights. The determination of the convent to promote and, if needed, defend the cult of St. Ludmila can be explained by nothing more than the fact that the holy mother of the Przemyślitz was crucial for the legitimization proposed of the abbey. As many other ecclesiastical institutions, the nunnery of St. George was connected with its patron, or in this case patroness, by the strong bond of mutual obligations. Monks, nuns, or canons needed a saint to stress their position, identity, and autonomy, especially when it was questioned or began to be doubtful. This was the case of the Prague nunnery, whose position was based on its close relation with the Przemyślitz. The figure of the Holy Mother of the dynasty illustrates this bond very well, which was especially important when, in reality, it weakened. On the other hand, the saint, to play the legitimization role, needed a vivid cult and, from this point of view, was dependent on the ecclesiastical institution which took care of his or her relics and veneration. We may notice such a support of St. Ludmila's cult from the community of St. George Nunnery in the time when it was rather modest. And it seems that um, it, it, it seems to have been successful. It would be too much to talk about its flourishing in the second half of 12th century and the beginning of the 13th century. It was, however, stable and widely accepted then, as can be proven by the presence of her feast in almost all Bohemian calendars. Maybe, therefore, it is not a coincidence that uh, it was then that the bond between the abbey and the dynasty was also in a way re-established. It might be illustrated by the fact that at the turn of 13th century, for the second time in its history, the monastery received the abbeys coming from the Przemyślitz. But this is probably to be discussed in another paper, given probably by somebody else, because maybe I shouldn't say that, but I feel a little bit tired with Santa Ludmila. I, I really admire her and I really enjoy research, um, but that's probably my last paper about that. <laughs> Keep my word. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. Now, our third speaker, Sarah Ellis Nilsson. Um, going to have a presentation. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the organizers. I'm just going to move that a little bit further away. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers, and it's really nice to see everybody today. I'm one of those people who hasn't been at a conference in real life for two years, so I'm feeling <laughs> very happy to be here with you today. Um, before I start, I just want to do a bit of advertising. I don't have it up there, but um, I'm part of a really big digitization project. For those of you who like saints, which I assume that's all of us in this room and out there listening, um, we're mapping uh, the cults of saints uh, in all of Sweden and Finland uh, for the medieval period, so and up to the late 16th century. So if you're interested in that, I can send out the link. It's a, just an input inf interface at the moment, but it is open um, and can be used with, uh, within reason, but we're launching in about two years. So I just wanted to inform you about it. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so today I'm gonna be talking about Sweden and uh, Denmark. And the title of my paper is The Mutually Dependent Relationship, Saints and the Leg Legitimization of Ecclesiastical Elites Before 1300 in Sweden and Denmark. So as you all know, saints have been an important feature of the Christian church since the first men and women began to be called sanctus or sancta. The development of the cults of particular sancti was intertwined with the development of the church as an institution and the formation of an elite. The roles that have been attributed to the saints, however, are many and varied. Interest in the saints, their lives, and their intercessory abilities was shared by people in all social groups and walks of life, and not just the burgeoning elite. And as we heard in the first paper today, um, there's also this sense of belief um, and the importance of saints also on an individual perspective. Um, especially within the newly emerging eccles ecclesiastical elite, however, a mutually dependent relationship can be identified that was important in legitimizing both this new social group and the establishment of new saints cults. So for these groups, saints provided and provide an important symbolic resource. In turn, saints and their cults needed to be initiated and promoted by living individuals. And if the veneration was not endorsed by ecclesiastical institutions, it risked being forgotten or becoming illegitimate or prohibited. In this paper, I present a case study which discusses the legitimization, fun le legitimization function of the cults of saints in the newly Christianized Sweden and Denmark by identifying mythopoetic movements uh, in the promotion and creation of early multi-local saints cults, also called native saints by some. This approach explores the concepts of multi-local saints coined by Alan Thacker, among others, and builds on my earlier exploration of Lars Boye Mortensen's concept of mythopoetic moments uh, as mythopoetic movements. Um, in this slightly modified model with mythopoetic movements, a sense of conscious agency is added and helps in the analysis of the way in which saints were used as the Christian histories of the Nordic countries were written and how or why saints were created and promoted during this period. It suggests that the cults of saints, in order to survive, needed the support of the ecclesiastical elites, while the elites needed the saints in order to justify certain actions and promote an understanding of the Christianization of the region. So this approach emphasizes that promoting and using the saints could be an active undertaking shared by heterogeneous groups throughout society. The examples that I'll be delving in today are of multi-local saints that were used by ecclesiastical elites to legitimize people and places as valid members of the Christian church and to write them into the Latin Christian milieu in the ecclesiastical province of Lund or medieval Denmark, it's not exactly the same thing, but yeah, and the ecclesiastical province of Uppsala or medieval Sweden and Finland. It's important to note that these are not the only local saints in these ecclesiastical provinces, but they were selected to provide a representative cross-section. 
So I'm going to first briefly introduce the saints in question and then discuss how the development of their cults fit into a number of different themes using the lens of mythopoetic movements to discuss these. These themes tie into questions of the use of saints in the legitimization of the elite, the theme of the conference, and include the stories told about the Christianization of the region, the placement of new ecclesiastical institutions, including bishoprics, and the existence or, be, or continued being of ecclesiastical institutions. So the first who's who here of today's presentation. Um, all of the saints uh, chosen were somehow connected to the legitimization of ecclesiastical institutions, at least on a local level. And the information of the saints that I'm just going to briefly present now mostly come from their legends or found in their liturgies or the Vitae. Um, so for Denmark, we have Theodorus of Vestavig. You recognize the next one, Leif Dagerbrebe, who Stefan talked about already this morning. Um, but Theodorus was a missionary, reportedly from Thuringen, who traveled to England, Norway, and Denmark in the early 11th century. He built a church in Vestavig in the northeast of Jutland and then served as a priest until his death from natural causes. And Luf as we've heard, um, we hear mostly about him in Adam Bremen and the Chronicle of Bishops of Ribe, was from Frisia and worked as a missionary in Scandinavia in the 10th century. Um, there's also claims that he became a bishop in Denmark before he was martyred. Um, and then there's also Ketelis or Scheld of Viborg, who's a holy priest and a provost of the cathedral chapter in Viborg, who lived in the early 12th century and had connections to the papacy. And then we have Margaret of Höjese, or Roskilde, who was a lay person who lived in the 12th century. She was killed by her husband, who claimed it was suicide, and after miracles occurred at her grave, she was then venerated on a local scale as a martyr. And then for Sweden, we have Siegfried of Växjö, which is the university where I am at, um, is in that city, who was a missionary bishop, um, reportedly from England, who came to Suetia, um, which then is translated to Sweden, to preach to a certain King Olaf. And he founded the bishopric of Växjö. His legend also contains three nephews who were martyred near Växjö. However, Siegfried himself was not a martyr. Then we have Eskil, who's also a missionary bishop, who worked around Tuna, which is an area of uh, Södermanland, if you can see, see up on the map um, there, I hope, with the, one of the green markers there, um, who lived in the 11th century. Uh, he was converted to Christianity in, uh, sorry, he wasn't converted, yeah, he was Christian. He came from England, apparently, and was martyred as part of local resistance towards his missionary work in the area. And then we have Botfid, who was a layman, who lived in the 11th century and he was converted in England and returned home and he was martyred by one of his slaves who had freed. And then Eelin, uh, who is a lay, lay woman who lived in Vestjutland, uh, was connected to the town of Skövde, uh, whereas it's thought that she lived as a widow and here she dedicated her life to God's work instead of remarrying but doesn't become a nun and so on. And she's also murdered in what is, can be considered a blood feud by her son-in-law's family, but it's interpreted as a martyrdom. And then finally, Henrik of Finland, who supposedly also came from England, you're seeing there's a pattern here, um, uh, to Sweden in the mid 12th century. He's connected with the so-called crusade to Finland, um, undertaken with King St. Eric, uh, where he was later martyred. Right, so you get the idea that these are all early saints, um, I hope, uh, from varying walks of life, both then bishops or missionary bishops and lay people. So if we think about the Christianization of the region and how this, these things that I just briefly mentioned fit into it, an important aspect uh, of that is related to how the legends fit into the conversion or Christianization narrative. There's a connection, uh, this is a common practice uh, in both ecclesiastical provinces, this connection to the, the how, how was our area converted. And all of these saints, of course, are connected to this, uh, the period, uh, the 11th or the 12th century. The later saints aren't at all uh, discussed in the same way uh, in the 13th century. Some of these stories connect saints to various missionary bases in England or the continent, such as Frisia or Thuringen, and they include Lufdag of Ribe, Theodgardus of Vestavig, Eskil of Tuna, Botvid, Siegfried, and Elin. And even Henrik of Finland, of course, uh, with the Christianization or the conversion in, uh, in uh, Finland. Henrik is a missionary bishop saint, and he's used to legitimize the political control of another region through his legend. 
Um, as many of you might be aware, the story was later spun as a crusade, and he's seen as, Henrik is seen as the figure doing the converting and suffering martyrdom. But the story is used in the mythopoetic movement to incorporate Finland into the burgeoning Swedish realm as well as the uh, province. So many of these saints' legends describe the way in which a particular area was converted, or well, the, what the role the saint played. So Henrik we have, but also Botvid, Eskil, Elem, and Lufdag, they are all martyred as part of the element, an important element of the story of suffering. So look here, we have people who offered their lives to bring us into this wider Christian community. Another interesting aspect of this mythopoesis is the official conversion story of the different areas of the province of Uppsala are often connected to England. We have Bootford here who converted in, in England and came back to spread Christianity as a layperson. We have Eskil and Siegfried who are missionaries and also have a tie to England. On the other hand, um, in terms of uh, Theodorus and Lufdag, we see Frisia and Thuringen, uh, which are named instead for Denmark. Um, Bootvid, who I've na named a few times, uh, provided a key example of the transition period. He's also an important figure to refer to in building up a Christian community in the area that would eventually become the Diocese of Strängnäs. There's details of church building that he um, undertakes, his, in part his brother as well, who's uh, discussed in this way. We also have in Vestergötland, we have Elen as well, who, who uh, builds churches. Several of the saints were, as I said, um, described as church builders. Theodorus was also, and Siegfried, so the importance of Christi Christianizing the landscape here and cr contributing funds. Um, and um, in general, um, everybody can contribute, is what I see uh, there. So in this type of using the saints and legitimizing the entrance of the region into a wider Christi Christianity, missionary saints could be seen as important here, but they weren't only, as we see in the case of Elen and Botvid. Another important element that we find with these saints is the placement of new ecclesiastical institutions. So seen in a mythopoetic movement perspective, this is a conscious step by certain dioceses to use local saints to justify and legitimize the placement of new ecclesiastical institutions, including bishoprics and religious houses. Both provinces display a similar promotion of saints in terms of legitimizing the placement of a see by pointing to a holy place, a shrine, or an origin story. Some legends explicitly state and promote the saint belonging to one diocese. Siegfried is the prime example of this legitimization of the placement of the bishopric in Vecqua. Siegfried's legend explicitly states that the saint received divine inspiration as to where the church, that is the future cathedral and bishop's see, should be built, and that it was in this church that he was to be buried. There's a number of other saints, the ones that I'm about to name, that, have, that don't have as strong cases as Siegfried. There was no divine inspiration in the saint saying, wow, this is where I want to be buried, and this is where the church is going to be, and I'm the first bishop, and so on, as, as anyway expressed in the legend. But all these saints were directly connected to the legitimization of the location of bishoprics or religious institutions. First, for example, there's Theodorus of Vestavik, whose cult was particularly tied to the Borglum diocese, and some actually argue that a sea existed in Vestavig before, and then it was moved uh, to Borgler. Um, however, it's actually the Augustinian Abbey in Vestavig that truly legitimized its placement with having the shrine of Theodorus and its continued existence. Another saint who we've heard, who's also about as well with Stefan earlier today, which also was used to legitimize the placement of the cathedral, was Lufdag of Ribe, whose cult originated on Jutland. Um, the chronicle, of course, it's the Chronicle of Ribe, which is a little later, but it claims that a cathedral was built to house his relics, although, as we've heard, it later burnt down. Um, and it is Bishop Radolf, as we've heard, <laughs> who promoted the cult and arranged the translation. So this role of a saintly founder would have been an especially strong legitimizing element for the bishopric. On the other side of the Baltic, the legend of Henry of Finland contains the saint's wish to be buried near his place of death, founding a church, and then the translation of his body to the cathedral at Turku, and all of these provide extra uh, sanctifying or legitimizing elements for where the bishopric was then placed. Uh, similarly, Eskil should have provided a strong case for the bishopric in Tuna and for it to continue, because there was originally a bishopric there in that, in that uh, city or town. However, it was his place of martyrdom, Strängnäs, that instead used the saint to legitimize their holy placement and Tuna was probably moved there. Interestingly enough, though Eskil and Theodgardus, if indeed there was a sea at Vestavig, first if we believe that theory that it was then, then moved, 
Eskil and Theodorus provide interesting similarities. In addition to the taking over of a sea, um, so I say, or moving from one place to another, their cults were maintained and used in the legitimization of abbeys. Um, for Eskil's uh, part, it was the Order of St. John uh, in Tuna. These were established around their shrines and controlled the cult together with the local bis bishopric. So my third theme was uh, legitimizing ecclesiastical institutions, which of course starts with the legitimization of their placement, but can, can continue, the continued being, we could say, of ecclesiastical institutions, can also be legitimized by their own special local saints. It's important to link the events to a general sacred history and thus use the saints in legitimizing these institutions. Saintly endorsement of these institutions enhanced Episcopal authority, and this can be seen in the writing of the early diocesan history in the 13th century. Uh, in, in Turku, for example, and a connection with St. Henry. A parallel to my findings in my study can be found elsewhere, including in Adina Bozowski's study of Normandy and Germany from the 9th to 12th century, century. So this idea that the discovery of relics and the creation of hagiographies is a necessity in the newly Christianized area. In this region, there's a need for new relics, new patron saints, new holy places in the landscape. Um, and these saints are important in that way to legitimize this new Christian region. All of the saints mentioned in this paper really fit into this theme, and of course there's no time to go into all sorts of examples. Um, and although not all local saints were used in legitimizing bishoprics specifically, all of the saints can provide local sanctorum or holy places for new bishoprics. So in the existence of holy places is found um, a sense of sanctifying the landscape and in turn legitimizing the institutions that promote them and uh, tolerate or, lit or uh, promote um, and uh, their continued existence. So for instance, we have again uh, Siegfried who claimed that Becker had been a bishopric since his establishment of the church in the region. And this is also an important claim against the influential lean shipping bishopric, which, um, which connects the whole, uh, or surrounds uh, the whole Becker, which is the smallest bishopric in the Uppsala ecclesiastical province. Buford offers also another example, in case, as I said, it's the Diocese of Strangness, which was provided with holy places within its boundary. We have bishops here who are both interested in the consecration of the church, not so um, strange perhaps, um, but that we have named bishops, such as Bishop Yard of Strangness and the Uppsala archbishops that are interested in, in, um, uh, in, in um, confirming the, the uh, consecration of the churches um, that are dedicated to Bootfeet. And we also have the translation of Bootfeet's relics that is controlled then by Strengnes. We also have Ketelis in Viborg, who was not the first bishop, nor was he ever bishop, in fact, but is the provost of the cathedral chapter, and he was the first local saint to be actively promoted in Viborg, starting in the late 12th century. His cult spread, though, throughout Denmark, um, and it was actually Archbishop Absalon, who we've heard about, who's really interested in, in promoting or in controlling the saints' cults in Denmark. And Kedilis provided the Vibor Diocese with a favorable saint, one who had done important work for the diocese and showed it in a good light. He was a great candidate as a local saint who also had papal approval, um, connections to the papacy, both in his lifetime and afterwards uh, as a saint then. Um, in addition to providing local holy places for the diocese, we also have Margaret, um, uh, who provided uh, places of pilgrimage for Roskilde, for example, um, and was connected to also the Bishop of Roskilde, Absalon, who was later the Archbishop, and who worked for her canonization, which was unfortunately never finalized. Uh, thus, in some ways, she was also informed in a form of leg legitimization in a slightly broader perspective, as she seems to have been a member of a family connected to the ecclesiastical elite. So there's a couple other saints I've listed there, um, and in general they just provide exempla and local sanctorum for both places and areas within the bishop's jurisdiction. Theodorus, it's Vestavig, as we've said, Luftag, it's Ribe, Eskil, Tuna, and Strengnes, Ellen for the Skara bishopric, and Henrik for uh, Orbo. Right, so in this paper I've discussed briefly how it is possible to see how saints were created and promoted in mythopoetic movements in which they were activated consciously with a particular purpose in mind. In this case, I've just considered how Danish and Swedish saints fit as instruments or elements of the legitimization as found in the stories told about the Christianization of the region, the placement of new ecclesiastical institutions, including bishoprics, and finally, the existence of ecclesiastical institutions. 
So the title of my talk, and indeed the premise that I went from when I was originally uh, planning this, asserts that saints and ecclesiastical elite institutions have a mutually dependent relationship, that one does not exist without the other. Um, taken at face value, it seems an unproblematic statement of equal partnership. And yet, I also think this assertion needs to be put into perspective. It's true that knowledge of the saints and their officially sanctioned veneration would not exist in society without being created by people and promoted by ecclesiastical institutions. However, although in some cases the institutions need the saints for legitimacy and a clear and holy connection, these institutions are not entirely dependent on the saints themselves in their existence and legitimacy. On the other hand, saints need people and people need saints. People's relationship with saints is one of an indeterminate temporality. Saints are of the past, but also of the present in their use in legitimization. With that said, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thanks. So, thank you so much to our speakers. It's now time for some questions. So, there's a question for Harold. Um, I mean, quite a lot of these texts would have been produced in monasteries, right, in the 12th century. I presume we don't know, but I wonder, do you think these texts were produced there, or at least partly, um, to promote this view of society that, 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 that you, exp you explained? Or do you think it was an unconscious kind of a, that the ruling elite began to read these or listen to these texts and sort of through osmosis, they began to change their attitude? Or do you think it was a conscious um, uh, yeah, effort by the by the monasteries to produce these texts for precisely the, this purpose. I'm sorry, I, I know it's impossible to answer, but have you thought about this question? Yeah, thank you. Particularly in relation to the monasteries. I mean, the monasteries are kind of, a, you know, emerged in the 12th century, and I presume they are producing these texts. Um, so I wonder if it's something that they consciously do to affect society, or do you think it's just uh, you, no. you talked about this paradigm shift that happens? Is this some unconscious, uh, or do you think it's a, a campaign or of some sort? Yeah. Um, all around, uh, all around Europe. So it was quite standard and accepted uh, that the, the that uh, these texts were there and they were used. Um, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily very useful to think about this as uh, as uh, as these texts are some sort of tools or some sort of. Uh, weapons in the church's arsenal or something like that. Uh, but uh, that does not change the fact that these, they are, um, they are full of what I've thought, or, or yeah, they are, um, yeah, like I said, fraught with this potential. These, these, these ideas are quite um, strong and um, sociopolitically uh, significant, but but the, I, I don't want, I don't think it's necessarily helpful to think about this as some sort of a campaign.
questions? One short remark to the paper of, of Grzegorz uh, about uh, Saint uh, Ludmila. Um, uh, one uh, factor is uh, important, I think, uh, as far as the connection between the uh, cult of Ludmila and the uh, Przemysl dynasty is concerned, uh, namely um, the um, pattern of names. Uh, would you like to s say something about the, the, the appearance of the name Ludmila in the dynasty? Uh, the, the, the question uh, seems to me vital uh, because of the um, almost um, completely absent uh, 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 essentially there is n n no use of a uh, 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 name of Wenceslaus until the beginning of the 13th century. What about the use of name Ludmila in the in the uh, Przemysli dynasty? So, so at least in the, in the period I was dealing with, there is one example um, of at least, uh, as well as I remember, of, of using the name um, Ludmila in the second half of the 11th century. There is this figure we we don't really know a lot about about her, but she's called by by Cosmas um, Famula Dei. And she um, she's uh, she's presented as a sister of a duke who organized uh, his funeral, um, but but and, and in fact it was discussed by by some scholars if maybe she was uh, an abbess of Saint George, um, you know that would fit of course very well that somebody who is called Ludmila is also the the nun in. Uh, uh, in in uh, Saint George, it was quite important from my perspective because if she would be the the, the abbess in uh, in Saint George, that would of course be completely opposite to my argument that that the, the Przemysl, members of the Przemysl dynasty did not serve the um, uh, in the monastery. But but considering that Cosmas called her simply Famula Dei without mentioning her position, abbess is quite unlikely that. That she was, uh, um, that she was uh, in, in this monastery. However, this 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 fact that she's called only Famula Dei without any uh, other information, we have no knowledge about her from elsewhere. Might suggest that she was somehow, I mean, she served somehow in um, religiously. Maybe even she was, uh, I don't know, a recluse or some something alike. More questions? Well, I, I have one for, for you, Sarah. Um, because I, I was quite fascinated by, by this, um, by this uh, conflict that seems to be between uh, two places, like in Strengnes and Tuna, arguing about Eskil and then the case of, of Fergus or, or Theo de Garos. Um, but could you say a bit more about about uh, what we know about Theodogarus and, and how he was argued over in between Vestavik and, and Berglund. What is the um, what, what what are the claims? What, what is the conflict? If that makes sense. Thank you for the question. Um, it's always hard to go last right before lunch. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So we unfortunately don't really have very many sources for it. Um, it's uh, the work that has been written mostly on that is Sven Clausen, who's published an article on that. Um, and he, um, he contemplates or he theorizes on, on this movement because there is, there is the, the sense that, that we're, they're claiming that there, is a, there are really valid reasons for putting the, the, um, the diocese in, in Vestavik first and then moving it to Borglum. But unfortunately, it's one of those things where the sources really don't exist. So there doesn't seem to be any arguing over him. There seems to be a lot of cooperation. And that, well, he can stay there at the abbey, but he's also our, our saint for, for the diocese. And it, I, I think it's interesting because there's a parallel with, with Eskil, where in the diocese of Tuna isn't, isn't moved in conflict um, there doesn't seem to be any conflict in the move to either Strangness or Vesterwas. There's also a discussion. I see Strangness being 
more uh, uh, because it's his place of martyrdom that it has this claim and it claims his relics and, and so on. So, and I know that, that maybe we'll find out more when we, we get that edition of the, of the uh, office and things. But that's, yeah. Uh, so there was a question from uh, David. While I was muted. Okay. Uh, there was a, uh, it's, it's not a question, just, just a comment on those Tremislic names. Uh, well, the, the, the Ludmilla from the end of the, Elf century is not the only one. There is also another one from the end of the 12th century, which was a completely secure person. And uh, regarding Václav and the use of his name uh, by the Przemyslits, well, they use it several times. Uh, it seems there was a, a son of Boleslav II called Václav who died as a youngster. And there were at least two uh, Václavs in 12th century uh, in those Moravian branches of Chemistry dynasty. So uh, the name was not that unused as it might seem, because uh, when we just focus on the ruling princes, uh, that's that's all. Now you and Harald, Harald, one question is Harald, and that's about the uh, elite in, in, in Iceland. Can we actually draw a line between the secular elite and the religious elite? Because basically, we're talking about, so to say, same families controlling both, so to say, the bishops, the churches, and at the same time being chieftains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually just very good to get this question because uh, I must admit that um, uh, I had not, so I had been working quite a lot with the, uh, these dynamics in society, and uh, but not necessarily from the from the perspective of uh, or or with thinking about uh, the concept of elite. So I was uh, jumping a little bit uh, into the deep pool here, and so more, uh, maybe I, I went a little bit ahead ahead of myself. Um, yeah, uh, but just to think a little bit out loud, um, I think that um, so um, to be, so at least in and that is maybe one part of what I was trying to say. Maybe it was not so clear that before um, these changes or these shifts that I was speaking about in the, until the 12th century, that this differentiation between. Uh, the, in general, between these notions of the of the secular and the and the religious, uh, um, um, I don't know how much sense that makes. Um, but uh, but at least it is. I would and um, and as I said in the in the talk, I was also think it was vague and it was absolutely not. And the, and the conceptualization of these and the differentiation between this, it was probably not clear. But it got increasingly clear. I would or that is what I'm somehow hinting towards, that it was getting clearer with, uh, with time and through such encounters and especially with uh, reform where they were working with, at least where, then where they were thinking about uh, such uh, differentiations or at least, yeah, and working, working with that. So, yeah, so maybe just to, and I emphasize, I'm thinking out loud and I will work uh, uh, and I will um, continue thinking about this, uh, but so I would, maybe say something like this, yeah, it was slowly, maybe gradually um, crystallizing or it was being carved out some sort of differentiation, but um, let me stop talk now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we do have time for some more questions, if anyone has any. No? Well, in that case, um, I think we can go for an early break and perhaps have a longer coffee break than scheduled. So thank you again and, and um, let's give one more applause to, to our speakers.
Mrs. Karen Stark, who will be speaking about the promotion of the Marian cult in 11th and 12th century Hungary. Do I have to press anything to start the PowerPoint? Uh, no. Oh, no, it's up there. Thank you. Um, well, first, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And um, before I begin, I just want to make a, a quick apology because actually my time frame is going to go up to the year 1300. And uh, I think actually it's a good place to end because it represents the end of the Arpadian kings and the beginning of the Antrim kings. So it's kind of a, a natural division point in medieval history of Hungary. So the use of the image of the Virgin as a tool of leg legitimization in medieval Hungary is intimately connected to the first Christian king of Hungary, Stephen I who supposedly offered the Hungarian kingdom to the Virgin on his deathbed. Thereafter, the figure of the Virgin, the patroness of the kingdom, as the source of legitimate authority, was promoted by the Arpadian kings. Evidence of royal patronage of Mary's cult can be identified in the artistic and textual record, as well as in the ecclesiastical topography of Hungary. Uh, the Virgin was the patron or co-patron of five of the 11 cathedrals of medieval Hungary, and she was also the patron of the sacral center of the Hungarian kingdom, the royal chapel and collegiate church of Sekes Vehervar, founded by King Stephen, which would later become the burial place of both himself and his son Emmerich. Unfortunately, there is little extent evidence of how secular elites in Hungary promoted the Marian cult before the 14th century. However, their efforts can be identified in the Marian Patricinia of Hungary. Through the foundation of churches, monasteries, and chapels dedicated to the Blessed Virgin, they established a physical connection between themselves, Mary, and the authority she represented. The foundational narrative behind the concept of Mary as patroness of Hungary was recorded in the Vita Meyer of King Stephen, composed circa 1083, the year he was canonized. It states that, quote, by an oath and offering amidst unceasing prayers, Stephen placed himself with his kingdom under the protection of the everlasting Virgin Mary, the mother of God, Steve, unquote. Stephen's dedication of the country to Mary has been viewed as a method to evade the claims of both German lands and the papacy. In a letter written in 1074 by Pope Gregory VII to King Solomon of Hungary, he chastised Solomon's cooperation with the Germans claiming that Rome had suzerainty over Hungary, since, um, quote, Hungary, which King Stephen of old offered and handed over to St. Peter, with all right and power, belongs to the Holy Church of Rome. A later letter written by Pope Urban II in 1096 to King Coloman made similar claims. He urged Coloman to obey and honor Saints Peter and Paul, the apexes of divine authority, just as Stephen, he claimed, had done. Coloman's commissioning of a second vita of Stephen, which included a second reference to Stephen's dedication of the kingdom to Mary, makes a lot of sense in this context. By promoting the idea that Stephen had offered the kingdom to the Virgin Mary instead of St. Peter, Hungarian rulers were able to circumvent the papacy's claim, deriving their authority instead from the Blessed Virgin herself. The instrumentalization of the figure of the Virgin in the service of royalty continued throughout the Arpadian period. The Virgin Mary was well represented not only in the cathedrals of medieval Hungary, but in the whole ecclesiastical and monastic landscape. The number of churches, chapels, and monasteries dedicated to her in medieval Hungary is huge. Historians have put that number at almost 600 in the past. However, I believe that number is closer to over 900. These Marian churches were not only royal foundations, but also ecclesiastical and private. In addition to individual nobles, whole noble families, um, Nemzetsheg in Hungarian, which maybe in English is closest to the term kindred, could found and patronize churches. Uh, the foundation of churches by secular elites serves several functions for their founders and patrons. They may have served as burial places and cult centers for themselves and their families. 
demonstrated respect for tradition or interest in new trends in religious devotion, been a source of income, and demonstrated their social standing and connections to greater noble, royal, or religious networks. When nobles cho chose the Virgin Mary as the pat patricinium of their newly founded church, they were making a deliberate choice based on multiple factors. Though the bishop had to give his permission to use a determined patricinium, in medieval Hungary, the highest ecclesiastical leadership did not have a decisive role in the choice of patricinium, especially for village churches. Sometimes the namesake of the founder could determine the choice, but in the case of churches dedicated to Mary in Hungary, this does not seem to be the case. What does appear to have been influential in the choice of Mary and Patricinia were a personal devotion to vir the Virgin on the part of the founder and or their community, and a desire to emulate uh, royal promotion of the Marian cult. In the early county seats of Hungary, the church located in or near the, near the castle of the count was usually dedicated to the Virgin. So there was already early on this association between a Marian church and local authority. While most of the earliest churches and monasteries were royal foundations, the majority of churches in Hungary founded throughout the Middle Ages were founded as patronal churches. Churches founded and patronized by individual nobles, kindreds, or even whole communities held patronage rights over the church, which could be passed on to their descendants or others or even sold. Uh, for example, the first mention of the Church of the Virgin Mary of Vizsgerad and I'm talking about the Visegrad in um, Slova modern Slovakia, not the more famous Visegrad, which is along the Danube. Um, the first mention was in the will of Bodmer I of the Boshani kindred, uh, Boshani branch of the Divet kindred from 1258, when he bequeathed a church to the Premonstratensian Abbey of the Virgin Mary in Torrance County. We also know that at least by 1285, the, the Church of the Holy Virgin of Gaborian. Um, which was later a parish church, belonged to Yuvad Kindred. More is known about the patronage of monasteries by secular elites. Uh, the Virgin Mary was by far the most popular patricinium of Hungarian monasteries. Of the 85 monasteries dedicated to the Virgin, they were founded before 1300. 32 were founded by individual nobles or kindreds. So this gift shows um, the earliest Marian monasteries in Hungary, and you can see how at first they were all like primarily royal, and as time goes on, you get a trickling in of uh, noble dedications, and there's this explosion of proliferation um, at basically the same pace of royal um, monastery foundation by nobles. So the earliest Marian monastery founded by secular elites is the Benedictine Monastery of Schar located there. Um, it was founded between 1040 and 1045 by the Abba Kindred, and some historians attribute its foundation to a specific member of the Abba Kindred, King Samuel Abba, who was buried at the monastery. But regardless, it functioned as a private and not a royal foundation. Not much is known about the early history of the monastery. However, it would make sense that the Abba Kindred would choose to dedicate it to the Virgin Mary. The 13th century Gesta Hungarorum noted that the ancestors of the Abba kindred were pagans, were pagan dukes of the Cumans who joined the Hungarians in the second half of the 9th century. The foundation of a monastery dedicated to the Virgin, the patroness of Hungary, in the area of Shar, which is considered the ancestral state of the Abba kindred, may have been an attempt to strengthen the ties between their lineage and Hungarian religious traditions. Certainly, though, they were inspired by the actions of King Stephen, who had founded many Marian churches and monasteries during his rule. By choosing to be buried in his kindred's monastery dedicated to the Virgin, Samuel Abba was also following in the footsteps of Stephen, who had been buried at the church of the Virgin Mary of Sekesvihervar. Members of the Abba kindred uh, founded three additional monasteries dedicated to the Virgin, all of the Benedictine order, before 1300, the most of any noble kindred. Monastic orders may have played a role in the patricinia of churches founded and patronized by secular elites as well. Marian patricinia and devotion to the Virgin were closely associated with the Cistercian order. 20 Cistercian houses dedicated to the Virgin were founded in Hungary before the year 1300. Every Cistercian house was traditionally dedicated to the Virgin, likely a tradition inherited from the Molem Abbey. 
No Cistercian houses were founded by secular elites in Hungary until 1194. And by then, five Cistercian abbeys had already been founded, first by King Geza II and then by King Bela III. These royal foundations were roughly contemporaneous with the expansion of the order in the rest of Europe. So the absence of noble foundations until the late 13th century could be seen as a conservative attitude among local nobility towards monastic reform ideas. However, it's possible that the Cistercian order had higher requirements for founders than older orders, at least in its early history, which might have dissuaded non-royal founders. The first secular elite who made a Cistercian foundation was Baden Dominic of the Mischgold's kindred, who founded the uh, Cistercian Abbey of Borsch Monastor, which is today uh, Klostermarienburg, Austria, in 1194. Uh, and Dominic had previously vowed to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He never fulfilled this vow, so his foundation may have been an effort to make up for this, as well as to serve as a burial place for himself and his descendants. Dominic's choice to found a Cistercian Abbey does not appear to reflect a shared appreciation for the cult of Mary or Cistercian ideals, at least from the extent sources. Rather, he appears to have been emulating the current Hungarian ruler, Bela III, who founded five Cistercian abbeys during his reign. King Bela III was an avid promoter of the Marian cult. Uh, it was during his reign that the Virgin would first appear on Hungarian coinage, and although her image would not appear on Hungarian coinage again until the reign of Matthias Corvinus, these coins circulated throughout the Carpathian ba uh, Basin, and in so doing, helped spread the cult of the Virgin and her connection to Hungarian rulers. It was also Bela who was responsible for the visual manifestation of the Stephen legend on the Estacom Cathedral. The Porta Speciosa, the adorned tympanum of the Estacom Cathedral, was commissioned by him and Archbishop Job of Estacom between 1185 and 1196. On the outer tympanum, the Virgin Mary and Christ Child are depicted seated on a throne, framed by the spiritual and temporal founders of Hungary. St. Stephen stands on the Virgin's left, and St. Adalbert to her right. King Bela III and Archbishop Job are pictured on the lintel below. And inscriptions accompanying these three allude to the dedication of the Kingdom of Hungary to the Virgin Mary. Have, historians have long suggested that there was a familial connection between Bon Dominic and Bela III. While the exact nature of their kinship is debated, it makes sense that the first non-royal foundation of a Cistercian abbey would be made by a noble with a familial tie to the ruler. The fact that the Abbey of Borshmanistor was later bequeathed to the king, who was by then the grandson of Bela III, Bela IV, by the son of Dominic in 1237, underlines the connection between Dominic and the ruling dynasty. Following the foundation of the Cistercian Abbey of Borshmanistor, the support of the Cistercian order became more uh, fashionable and more abbeys were founded by nobles in quick succession. The arrival of the mendicants in Hungary brought a revival in Marian foundations. Like the Cistercians, the first known founder of a Franciscan convent, convent in Hungary was the Hungarian king, in this case, Bela IV, who founded a Franciscan convent dedicated to the Virgin Mary in Estergom in 1235. But unlike in the case of the Cistercian order, nobles were quick to follow suit. One of the first private foundations of a Franciscan comment dedicated to the Virgin was made by Count Michael of Varasht of the Hahot Kindred in Semina in 1248. Devotion to Mary appeared to be um, continued to be closely tied to the Hahot's Kindred's uh, self-representation. Three of the five monasteries they founded during the Middle Ages were dedicated to the Virgin. The convent at Semina was still owned by Michael's descendants, in particular, the Banfi de Escholendva branch of the Hahut kindred in the mid 14th century. The convent was enlarged by Nicholas Banfi, who also made a large donation to said convent in 1355. The continued Marian devotion of the Banfi family is also apparent in a mural uh, painted in 1383 on the northern wall of the choir of the family's church also dedicated to the Blessed Virgin in Bantonia, about 30 kilometers northwest of Semina. The mural depicts the Bonfi family represented by three male family members of three generations, including the just mentioned Nicholas Bonfi at the uh, feet of the enthroned Mary. 
And while these last couple examples take us past the year 1300, I just wanted to give a more obvious example of like this continued Marian devotion and how it is a process. Before I conclude my presentation, I just wanted to make a few remarks on the categorization of patronage in Hungary. Uh, though the patronage of monasteries can be generally divided into royal, ecclesiastical, and private categories, these were not rigid, distinct divisions. For example, uh, the Cistercian Abbey of Bale was founded by Kilit, the Bishop of Eger, in 1232. However, it is classed as a private foundation and was claimed by members of Kilit's kindred, the Bale kindred, as late as 1381. This was not an isolated case. There are many instances of the patronage of a monastery, including four monasteries with Marian Patrocinia, founded by a prelate being taken over by members of the prelate's kindred after the prelate's death. So in practice, foundations made by prelates sometimes operated as private rather than ecclesiastical foundations. Um, addition, alternatively, a monastery could be founded by a noble or kindred and later be donated to an ecclesiastical institution. The Benedictine Monastery of the Virgin Mary in Shar, founded by King Samuel Abba, represents another case of patronage that does not fit neatly into one category. While possibly founded by Samuel Abba while he was king, um, and ultimately serving as his burial place, the Shar Monastery's operation and later patronage demonstrates that it was a private kindred foundation and not a royal one. So the borders between royal, noble, and ecclesiastical expressions of Marian devotion are not immutable. To conclude, the pattern that emerges from the examples I've given is that noble foundations of Marian churches and monasteries Fall, um, followed royal foundations, and that these noble foundations were made to emulate royal devotional trends, which is generally true. But the spread of the Virgin's image as a source of authority was not a purely top-down process. In addition to the image of the Virgin Mary being used by other early and high medieval rulers in a royal context, some of the earliest sources on the Hungarian kingdom note the Marian piety of the first Christian missionaries to Hungary, and the ardent Marian devotion of the Hungarian people. We cannot assume that the early Hungarian kings developed the image of a legitimizing Mary out of whole cloth. Hungary's secular elites also had to buy into this imagery. The promotion of the Marian cult by Hungarian nobles reinforced the royal use of her image, without which imagery like that of the Porta Speciosa and later similar commissions by Hungarian rulers would not have been able to successfully communicate their messages to their viewers. Thank you. And now, Dr. Sostowski from the University of Poznan will be speaking about the strategies of the use of saints in the in 12th century Poland. Okay, I just hope that it won't take too much time for me to get ready, but for the case. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, your introduction, uh, Professor. And uh, the Aegis of Aegidius in uh, 12th uh, century uh, Poland. Um, most, if most, if not all, of the phenomena I will discuss uh, today are long known to historians, uh, especially in Poland. 
as pretty much uh, all of the evidence is known. What will be new, and only to a point, is the frame within which I will discuss this phenomena. Concentrating, as uh, I understand the focus of this conference, uh, and the organizer project on saints as a symbolic asset of the elite and the various uses that was made, uh, that was made of this asset. Um, and the, the, this, is, this is the brief outline of, of my talk today. So I'll talk about the, 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 the lack of shrines in Poland in the 11th century, the evidence for cult of Giles in Poland, the stories told in 12th century and other evidence for, the, for this cult, and the aftermath in Poland and elsewhere, and I will end with, with the saint as symbolic asset of Polish elites and the mutuality, the, the, the topic that uh, comes uh, back often today, the mutuality of the relationship with Giles and his, uh, his abbey. So the shrines in Poland in the 11th century are on, the way, on their way out. If, if there were any, probably there was uh, one in the Gniezno. Uh, they, are, they are not there when, when the cult of uh, St. Giles is being introduced and uh, Polish elites participate in it. So, <coughs> the, um, the, the first source that we have uh, comes from Gesta Principum Polonarum, which is the first um, sort of a chronicle, or rather Gesta, written in Poland. Uh, in the uh, earlier 12th uh, century. And the story of Giles is given in two places. First, in the epilogus, which is uh, like a short peroration at the beginning of, uh, uh, of book one, and then a larger passage at the end of, uh, of uh, book one. And it is about the miraculous birth of Boleslav, the sterility of his mother, Judith, and um, um, and the desperation of Judith and Władysław Herman. So the pair uh, tries rather standard means by fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, all in hope of receiving the help um, standardly comparable, and the author compares this to Zacharias or Sarah. Since this was to no avail, they were approached by a Polish bishop, uh, Franco, who advised them a guaranteed remedy. There is a certain saint in Gaul, in Provence, in the south, close to Marseille, when Rhone flows into the sea. The name of the land is Provence, and the saint's name is Go uh, Giles. Such are the merits of his in the eyes of God, that whoever lays their devotion on him, uh, they are guaranteed to receive whatever they ask of him. Then Franco suggests, therefore, that the pair makes an image of a boy in gold, prepare royal gifts, and send all of this to St. Giles. The subsequently made image and chalice, both in gold, as well as other items in gold and silver, together with pallium and precious vestments, are all sent with faithful legates to province. Uh, this Franco is made, well, okay. Um, and, of course, the prince is miraculously born. Um, another source for this is the pretty much contemporary, slightly later, a chronicle of Bohemians by Cosmas of Prague. Cosmas gives this short story a shorter treatment. It is roughly similar. The, ag the agency is uh, uh, on Judith, uh, who is Bohemian, and, and to her chaplain. And there are some interesting, if subversive, twists in the, in the story. Um, Unfortunately, Cosmas does not suggest that after his patroness death, this Peter, this chaplain, returned to Prague. The departing messenger is, uh, the departing messenger is told by the abbot of Giles not to worry. There is no man who wouldn't be able to obtain whatever he sincerely asked of Giles. I even worry if we don't offend God when we fatigue him against the fate. Even if thanks to Giles' merits, he sometimes grants that what nature denies. Um, th those, those worries of abbots have an Augustinian ring to, to, to them, and uh, Cosmos obviously has an axe to grind. Um, and it sounds a little surprising coming from a Benedictine monastery famous for its, for its miracles. But then comes, uh, and so, who, who is Giles? Um, Giles is a, um, 
is a royal saint. He's a son of a Greek king, uh, contemporary both of uh, Caesarius of Arles, uh, living in the fifth and sixth in the fifth and sixth century, but also contemporary of Charlemagne. Uh, the, his hagiography is first produced in Saint Gilles in uh, the 10th century. It was recently edited. Uh, the best edition is from uh, uh, 2013. Uh, and there is also um, a reworking of it from the 11th century. The only the first Vita is very popular. There are uh, tens of copies uh, from the uh, 10th to 12th, uh, 12th century. And uh, this is a legitimizing effort to the extreme uh, for the abbey and against its enemies. Uh, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the local bishop of Nîmes. And uh, the saint is presented there as ultimate helper who never denies, um, who is also able to remit uh, Charlemagne's sin, which is too big to, uh, to, uh, to talk about. Uh, an angel of God comes from heaven and uh, has this, uh, this sin written down on a piece of paper, and it is shown to Giles, and um, this is... This is, this is what happens. So Giles is a royal saint, not in the sense of him being a royalty, but of course he is royalty, as his 10th century Vita informs us. He is also a royal saint in the sense of him being able to insert, intercede for kings, uh, to successfully mediate uh, in God's imparting forgiveness on the royalty. His intercession for Charlemagne, how he helped remit this sin, is unique. Um, also, in the fifth chapter of the book of St. James, which is a 12th century product, there is an exhortation to visit St. Gilles. The saint is presented as someone especially apt to act quickly. More than other saints, he is eager to help when asked. On the day when someone asks from the bottom of their heart, they will undoubtedly receive his blessed help. The next sequence of uh, sources that we have comes from Peter William, uh, who was a librarian uh, in Saint Gilles. He wrote Liber Miraculorum, uh, which exists in two recensions, uh, Liber, a continuation of Liber Pontificalis. He wrote a Necrologium for the Abbey and probably uh, uh, also Bularium. So in the, in the Necrologue, which is currently in the British Library, um, there are no less than 11 entries uh, here that are somehow connected with a, with a cult in, in Poland, directly or in, indirectly, and nine of them are um, um, given by, uh, by William himself. The two here, Maria Comitissa Polonia and Petrus Comes Polonia, are uh, somewhat later additions. Securely, uh, the... the, the, the the people that, that can be termed securely uh, local, Polish, uh, are five. There is Judith, uh, who, who makes appearance twice. There is Boleslav. And then there is a number of people, well, there is a, a, a Ladislav, uh, king of Hungarians. And there is a city, there is Citibor. And there is a number of people who, uh, Pierre Davy, uh, before, just before the Second World War, speculated that they might have been Polish also. <clears throat> then there is Liber Miraculorum Sancti Agidi, uh, which uh, contains, uh, now it contains 30 miracles, but about half of them are put together by William. The, 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 the other half is given by the interpolator from the later part, part of the 12th century. And the whole story takes place during the siege of Szczecin, in early 1120s, when uh, Boleslav is uh, waging war against, uh, against pagans, against uh, Pomeranians, um, uh, close to the Baltic Sea. The cupbearer Sieciech is terrified that he is going to die. And every day in the evening, he plans to confess his sins and receive absolution. But every day, he fails to do so. Then he boasts about it after a few days when they come back. So in a dream, St. Giles makes an appearance and Sieciech recognizes him by the mane of his white hair, just like in Vita Egidi, the 10th century Vita, and predicts that he is going to die soon. 
when the troop is back in Poland, Sieciek has to join the hunt of Bolesław, where he is maimed either by a bison or by an auroch. It's difficult to tell, really. Giles makes another appearance, and Sieciek cries for help and promises to make a pilgrimage. He does so anonymously. And uh, Peter uh, finishes the story. We have often heard these things from both religious priests and lay people who came from these parts for the purpose of prayer. What is interesting to me in this story, and I realize it is trivial, but still worth drawing attention to, is that Sieciech is perfectly aware of what is happening, even though we see him to a point subverting the cult, and he is promptly corrected, the scenario of what is happening, even if wild, it is a miracle, is not inc incomprehensible to him. It's a terrifying movie, but he has already seen it. He knows what to do. So the miracle is, as any miracle, beyond expectations, but at the same time perfectly within his horizon of expectations and experience. What is also interesting is the lack of clergy in this story. There is no frocked prompter visible or implied. The narrator, uh, to the narrator, Sieciek is exotic, but only because he is really far away. His gestures and his Christian outlook are, on the other hand, quite familiar. And this is uh, this uh, this 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 map is taken from the latest edition of uh, uh, of a book of miracles of Saint Giles, and it shows. Uh, well, it's 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 not a very good map. It's supposed to show the provenance of pilgrims, and uh, the 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 places which are which are cited. Um, but this map should be much larger to the east, and not only because of Poland. But one of the miracles from Peter describes a story taking place first in the Holy Land, and then Giles makes an appearance in Baghdad. Also, um, there is a direct mention of British Isles. So, <clears throat> the next the next evidence uh, that is uh, really uh, an evidence that is difficult to uh, to. Um, uh, to verify, are the Romanesque churches, uh, Sancti Egidi, uh, in Poland. They are the most visible sign of the cult. They, they seem so, at least. But the map that you can see here uh, definitely shows an optimistic view uh, that, we can, that we can date those churches to the 12th uh, century. There are even more optimistic views. The only book-length treatment of this subject uh, also uh, in includes as 11th century churches that are first attested as St. Giles from the, uh, in, uh, in 1964. So it's really, uh, uh, the, there is no serious work about this in the last couple of, of decades. But definitely <coughs> the churches in Kraków, in Inowód, uh, which, is, which is here, Ah, you, you don't see it. Okay, in in Ovuc, which is which is uh, okay. It doesn't really matter where, where it is now. Uh, in Krobia and in Wrocław, they 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 can be dated to the to the 12th century, most probably. The problem is we don't really have uh, that much archaeological work done there, to be to be sure. <clears throat> and then the afterlife of this cult in Poland. First, there is the introduction of Saint Florian to Krakow. Relics are translated in the, 12th century, in the later 12th century. And then there is a canonization of Stan Stanislas in the middle of the 13th century, who was a bishop of Krakow before, and this is an extremely powerful uh, cult. Um, Giles, at the same time, is not legitimizing any ecclesiastical institution in Poland. This is, this is, uh, this is his, his weak point. Uh, so already from the 14th century, the line records, Giles was then, Tung or Tung Temporis, famous for his miracles, but, on, but not anymore. So whoever asked for Giles' help in 13th century Poland was not recorded. Was it only because the elite cult fizzled out, for example, after receiving the relics of St. Florian? Or was it probably, like many other, supplanted with localness and grandeur of Stanislav? Um, and the interesting thing is that the explosion of the cult of St. Stanislavs already includes people of all social strata in his, in his miracles. 
and it legitimizes ecclesiastical institutions as well. So the cult fades away, but the memory of it is kept alive in the 13th and 15th century by historians, each one with different access to grind. For example, Franco of Poland becomes Lambert of Krakow in 14th century, and so on. There are slight changes going on there. Uh, in the later medieval literary tradition in Silesia, Peter Vost, the Comes uh, Peter that, 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 that we saw, is named, uh, the, his son is named Giles, alas, with no explanation and commentary. And this is probably fictitious, an echo of something, but we don't know of what. And uh, the development of the 15th century is such that a, pr a preposterous number of churches is supposedly founded under Władysław Herman and Bolesław III, so later 11th and early 12th century. Um, and we, we don't really know what to, well, we know what to do with most of them. They, they are ridiculous, but uh, what about the, the rest? And the afterlife of Polish cult elsewhere. There is a story of King of Scotland and Unimage Tot d'Argent in Le Lai del Désir, uh, written in Old French in the 12th century, which pretty much copies the, uh, the story of uh, Władysław Herman and, uh, and his wife uh, sending this, uh, this, this, this gift. Um, and also in Scandinavia, on the court of, of Hakon IV, um, the king of Norway, Iceland, and Scandinavian Scotland, in Old Norse there is, tra there is a translation of this text uh, as well, which is uh, um, an echo also. I was also able to find a very similar story in Lamspringe Abbey, foundation, foundation legend of Lamspringe Abbey. Uh, it is only known from a copial book from the 16th century, so it's uh, very, very late, but um, it describes how Rigdak and Imhildis in times of Sergius the, the second, there should be second here, um, produced an image of a, a, a statue of a golden boy uh, and were told to go to, to, to Constantinople to ask, uh, to ask St. Adrian, and they were able to, uh, to, uh, to get a child. And after life of Polish cult in St. Gilles. So there is the second redaction of Liber Miracula Miraculorum, which does not add any Polish miracles. The, most of the miracles added are miracles from Germany, uh, and they retain part of the older strata, uh, which, uh, which also includes the story of Sieciech. Then are the prayers of memory, the prayers and memory in Saint Gilles, about, mostly about uh, uh, the people that we saw um, in the necrologue. And this was all discussed with Polish pilgrims, even in the early modern period. Um, we have uh, sources from the 17th century when they discuss with uh, the stuff with uh, important Polish pilgrims. An offshoot of Giles cult in Poland uh, was probably also the, 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 the abbey uh, of St. Giles in Hungary, founded by Ladislav of Hungary. So, Giles is a symbolic asset of elites. The cult of Giles seems purely elite. This may be a source bias. There are no traces of it before the expedition of 1085. It is introduced by the Duke and his wife. <coughs> and uh, first, uh, it's the Duke, and then it trickles down to secular elites, the Kapberer Sieciech and Palatine Peter Vwost. Uh, but also, we have mentions of pilgrimages of secular clergy and laity. Interestingly, no monks uh, in Saint Gilles as pilgrims. This pilgrimage is by definition exclusive. It is 1,500 kilometers from Poland. So it's roughly, now it's two days by car, but, but r then roughly it's two weeks by, by a horse or two months by foot. One of the most interesting questions about saints' culture in 12th century Poland is to what extent is Giles extraordinary? Is this source bias? Giles and William are indeed connected to Giles. Accidental or a testament to the power of Giles? The knowledge of scripts of piety displayed by Władysław Herman, Judith, Sieciech, Peter of Wrocław and his wife Mary all suggest that they, or their, their milieus, it doesn't really matter, were not new to them. There have been some confusion, a certain roughness 
as displayed in Hungarian Ladislav letter to Monte Cassino, but at the same time, there is another letter from this, from roughly the same time, written by a bishop of Krakow, Matthew, and probably Peter Vlost to Bernard of Krakow, which is, which is much smoother. Scripts aside, I don't think that the cult of Giles was one of many, of, uh, of many similar cults in Poland. It was special not only to Gallus, but also for the later chroniclers. Uh, no one wrote similar stories about any other saint, local or external. Originally, Giles was used to obtain progeny from the greatest helper. Others have followed suit. Help in dire situations, which affect in pilgrimage. The pilgrimage per se, causa orationis, elite imitating ducal piety. Founding of churches of Giles could have spread the cult down the ladder, but most of the sources are late. Penitential pilgrimage, also there is a penitential pilgrimage of Boleslav III to Hungary to the monastery of Giles there. So the relationship of Giles and his abbey with Polish elites was mutually beneficial, legitimizing the cult, conforming the power of Giles, comforting the distressed Provence abbey. Peter William presents his aims rather straightforwardly in the prologue, to console the tribulations we continuously suffer. By the miracles of Giles, the minds of readers will be edified, but most of all, perhaps, those who fight us will come to their senses and abandon the ferocity of their malice. The abbey was, as is known, imperiled in a couple of ways. Uh, Cluny, who in 1076 obtained the right to reform Saint-Gilles and appoint its abbot. The other antagonists, Bishop of Nîmes, Counts of Toulouse, during all the troubles, the pilgrimage grew non-stop. In 1116, the monks consecrated the new church, and popes visited. The monastery managed to free itself from Cluny's claims only in 1132, but had to acknowledge Cluny's rights to reform it. <coughs> uh, Vinza, who, uh, who, who wrote a very interesting book about this, displayed how the abbey in its necrology tended not to include the claimants, both Cluniac or the secular counts of Toulouse, while at the same time developing and cultivating its network close to home as well as far away. Uh, <clears throat> so financially and ideologically creating the worldwide catchment area from Szczecin and Hedeby to Baghdad. Thank you. Gentlemen, mm, and now mm, Mrs. Karen Stinholm Lagergrant from uh, the L uh, Linnaeus University uh, will be speaking about the liturgical performance of the saints' offices. Uh, I would just like to hear back a, be a bit of multimodal. Um, uh, things going on here if I succeed. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm a musicologist and and I will also get some music.
and <laughs> I need to get back so I can edit All right, and see. Uh, um, maybe we should I just come back, okay? Okay, so okay. Have to okay. Have to <laughs> this is really, really exciting, and it's going to work. Um, This is the playlist. I want to get the first, the first okay. one, first one. Okay. okay. No, sorry, no. No, no I need to go back to the playlist. This one. So we'll stop there and then we'll go to the presentation. Let's see if that works. So, uh, and this introduces me as um, a musicologist and also partly liturgist. And uh, I started with presenting to you a hymn to Saint Olav, Rex Olavus. Um, and I will concentrate in my presentation on how people in the Middle Ages met saints in the form of liturgy and how this liturgy was organized. And liturgy, by liturgy, I mean everything that happens during a service. And uh, I have put a subtitle simply, How Do You Remember a Saint? The observance of a saint's office is a multimodal and multisensory event that involves sight, smell, spatial movements, and listening performed at regular times during a feast day. This is a true feast for all senses, and this is just a screenshot, what I uh, showed to you, from a filmed reconstruction of a parish mass that could have been celebrated in the Diocese of Linköping at the middle of the 15th century. It's to find on YouTube for those interested. Um, since saints' offices primarily were observed in cathedrals, they were accessible to anyone who entered the church on that day. Processions took place inside and outside church performed by uh, the clergy. And also religious orders and city guilds could be organizers of outdoor processions. The relics could be displayed and carried around and of course, lay people understood little, if anything, of the Latin text, but we can be sure of that they were familiar with the saints' lives. Add to this that saints' days often were connected with public festivities, such as markets and a day off. 
And I will, in my presentation, allow myself to move a bit further in time beyond 1300, since the source situation concerning Scandinavia and Saints offices is much better, and also since my own search has concentrated on the later period, especially in Saint Birgit, that was Sweden. So, we need to start with some basic liturgical circumstances. A saint's office was in a normal case performed once a year. A saint's office is a set of chant and a recited text based on the saint's vita, and it's celebrated with monophonic plain chant, commonly called Gregorian chant, which you, you just listened to. And the the once a year performance means that it often, but not always, was observed on its death day. But there were three possibilities for celebrating a saint the death day, the translation, and the canonization. Far from all saints were celebrated three times a year, but some, one such case is Saint Birgitta, who became the superstar, insane, superstar saint in late medieval Scandinavia. Some saints even got two offices. Examples of this is Saint Siegfried of Beckwe and again Saint Birgitta, but for different reasons. The original office for Saint Siegfried from around 1200 was replaced about 100 years later, around 1300, with a new, partial new one. And the veneration of him had changed for some reason. We don't really know why. Birgitta, on the other hand, got two offices that were used to support her canonization, which took place only 18 years after her death. Next thing is that a saint must be placed in the right category to be um, celebrated in the correct way. And there are uh, some different ways of categorizing saints, but these are the most commonly used. You could be an apostle, an evangelist, a martyr, including uh, widows, confessors, uh, including doctors of the church, bishops and abbots, and the last category are the virgins. And then you can be a virgin martyr also, that's a subcategory. So if one wanted to sing a full office for a saint, but not had one, so what did you do? There, then you had always the common of saints. These were standard offices with standard text for each of these categories. So we, if you had a martyr you wanted to celebrate with an office, but you didn't have his own office or her own office, you could always take the common of saints, the martyr section. And a saint also needed to be observed according to the rank it had in respect to the diocese. A saint could be observed with everything from only a memorial, that is a prayer, up to a full office covering all the canonical hours. And I will in the following consider saints who have been granted a full office and thus, thus had a solemn observance, saints that were regarded as liturgical VIPs. The framework of a saint's office is the normal divine office or the canonical hours and on that day replaced the ferial use and the, uh, the mass was also a special mass for that particular saint with proper chants and I will not consider the mass of a saint in this short presentation. So let's take a look at the liturgical day. the framework for the saint. So this is a standard liturgical day. It's probably familiar for many of you, but just a, a short, short um, rehearsal of what it is. So you start early in the morning at matins, where it's marked with number one, so it can start between two and four in the morning, which was then followed by Lord's number two, it's roughly five, five thirty. And then came the round of uh, the day, the little hours, the day office, starting with the prime, uh, number three, round six, the first time, of the, the first hour of the morning, followed by mass, and then you had terse, sext, known in the afternoon, and uh, then it, we have vespers in the afternoon, number seven. 
and you see that Vespers is, has a parallel to Lords, and then you round off the day with Compline, which has a liturgical parallel in, in Ters. And um, only in rare cases was liturgy for a saint provided also for the little hours, which I've marked here in red. So you have mainly saints' observance in Vespers and Matins, Lords. And then the celebration of a saint did not start at mass, Matins, it started at um, Vespers the, on the eve, the day before, the, with the first Vespers. And it was completed on the feast day with the, with the second Vespers. So a full office has two Vespers and one of everything else. And very often no little hours, then you just use the ferial use. You can also put it this way, what you always have in saint's office is matins, lords, first and second vespers, rarely, but sometimes, prime, terse, sext, known, compline, and then you have the mass chants, which treat the saint in various ways. So, let's now take a look at the content of the offices. For example, if you st we start with Saint Siegfried, which I've heard about earlier today, the name of an office is always taken from the first lines of the first chant in Vespers. So that's why the office, the, the old office for Saint Siegfried is called Celebremus Carissimi. And it introduces us to the feast and the saint and has the character of praise and the second sung item of uh, an office is the invitatory sung at matins. So this is very, has a very standard text what, what the themes are. So this is a very standard first chant of an office. And then we we'll go to an invitatory, which is the first chant of matins. Um, it's a long piece, which in total lasts for up to 10 minutes. So this is the uh, invitatory for saint. I didn't put it there, I put it on Saint Elen of Skövde. Starts. Um, and matins is a kind of highlight in the liturgy, but you remember it starts very early on in the morning, and it's very, I find it very interesting. Matins has readings from the Vita followed by chants called Great Responsory, rich, long, melismatic chants. The more solemn a saint was, the more readings it was granted. So you could have either three, six, nine, or 12 readings, all based on the saint's vita. And all of these readings were followed by a great responsory that lasted for two to six minutes. And these are performed by a group of singers with a solo verse for a skilled soloist for a group. So this is interesting to think about. The most complicated and the longest pieces were performed in the middle of the night or early in the morning. And matins was, for the biggest part of the year, at least here in Northern Europe, come from performed in the dark or with lit candles, if this was allowed. How did they achieve this on saints' days with liturgies only performed once a year? We don't know, no. It's really something that can keep me awake at night. So after the morning service, this matin service, lords took place and then the little hours and then the, they close the office with a second vespers. And the closing of the office also could have a text that reflects the character of the, the rounding off like a thank you for this saint's life, as we have, now I go into late 13th, 14th century, but this is the Magnificat Antiphon from Second Vespers from the bigoted office, Birgitta Matris Inklitz, a farewell sweet music who charmed the ears of the rulers. Uh, so it um, highlights Birgitta's extraordinary capacities. So, where do the melodies come from? Now, the melodies are always plain chant, commonly called Gregorian chant. They are essentially monophonic, very few examples of polyphony, 
And the question of the origin is a delicate question, which also have always, 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 uh, often has been charged with much cult of the genius, or rather authorities. Uh, but we can say that they come from these categories. They can be borrowed from another saint's office as a way of paying a marsh and not lack of creativity. Uh, we call this contrafact when you put new text to a known melody. Hymns are very typical to this. And the next category, the melodies that were borrowed but altered to fit the new text. And these borders between categories A and B are very fuzzy what we call this adaptation of musicology. And example of A and B are the office for St. Olaf, which is based on St. Augustine and St. Martin of Tours. And then we have what we call new compositions, meaning material without concordances in other sources. They include traces in A and B. You start to see how complicated this is. And these are unicum. St. Siegfried is one example of this. And the last category is B, D, uh, which mix A and C, and maybe we can call this mixed offices. This is my own suggestion of this genre. It's often hidden in, in category C. An example of this is what we just saw, Birgitta Mates in Klite. So to summarize, Saints Office work within a complicated web of inter intertextual relations, borrowings and illusions were the norm, and copyright never a problem. The music is in itself a symbol, a sign of what the saint is represented as. And this was something that medieval people active in liturgy were very well aware of. And how am I doing time? I have some, no, so I, have, I still have time. Yes, okay, thank you. Five minutes, perfect, thank you. So offices in category B and C can have a named author. An interest in concerning category B is that this has been the case even if it's clear that only the text is new or rather modeled on the Vita. And this is super complicated because as musicologists we want to separate music from the text and talk about authorship. But to be very short, the offices were, in my view, worked out by its users for their own use, and in this process they could test alternatives before eventually arriving at a solution that could be fixed on parchment. If melodies were borrowed, this was done in a careful way, building on role models that could be used to reinforce the saint's importance as standing in a light of Christian celebrities. The choice of melodies and text was a process guided by claims of authority and legitimacy. So what did they sing about? We can be very sure to say that they sang about three things. They sang about miracles, praise, and emblematic events in a saint's life. So this is, these are two miracles from the office of Saint Eric. Um, fantastic miracles. The martyr unloses the tongue of the priest so that he can sing with a clear voice. He has just lost his voice before mass. Poor priest. The man, man cut his throat with a knife and for him our saint obtained the restoration of life. So very practical hands-on miracles. Praise. Um, Helena Sjöbde. And here we often have also place names in the offices, Beskose, which is region of Estjötland, fortunate homeland, applaud joyfully, multiply your pious canticles in honor of your daughter. So this is next category, which you find a lot of praise. And the last is emblematic events in the saint's life. We heard this from, uh, I think Sara said, this is the hiking song, which I call it, uh, when Saint Secret erected a tent and indulged in a moment of rest while he was sleeping, led by an angel. He planned out with him the boundaries of a church, which eventually became the cathedral. To round off the practical reality of these offices, a lay visitor probably did not spend all day in a church listening to a full office. Probably mass was the most important moment to join in at. At other moments of the day, they could come to church to say prayers, light a candle, offer a gift. 
During these visits, they listened standing or kneeling in the nail to the office being performed in the choir, often perform performed behind a road screen. The choir formed a room in the room and gave the acoustic impression of a song coming from a big distance. Quite a lot of research has been done on this over the last years. So how long time did all this take? Calculations are difficult to make, but musicologist James McKinnon has calculated that the Benedictine office in St. Benedict's time in the 6th century took four to five hours each, but the liturgy increased over time, and in the 10th century he calculates that on great feast days, the liturgy took maybe as much as 10 to 12 hours to perform. And I have in this presentation tried to give you some practical information and ideas about saints' offices came to life. Liturgical circumstances have been sketched, and I've discussed something on how they were created. The performance and how they were experienced by lay people was also subject for some hard facts and speculation, and all in all, I hope to have given you some food for thought concerning how saints' vitae were transmitted into a liturgical context, and this is not folklore. A saint's office was always determined by forces beyond the realm of ordinary people, the elites. Most intriguing for me personally is the enormous achievement that was invested in these liturgies performed once a year. Thank you so much. interesting lectures, and now we're, be we're beginning the discussion. Who would you like um, to ask a question, please? No one? Or take part in the discussion? Yes, please. So, so I have a question to, to Karen, actually, um, related with the, with, with, with the um, uh, Virgin Mary as a patron saint of, of churches. I would say that it's always a tricky thing with, with the pop popular saints and to, to say that their patronage is in somehow meaningful because it might simply happen that they are patrons of many churches because they are popular, so that there is nothing nothing uh, there really. And this is especially true in the case of the Cistercians Monastery, which, we, which you mentioned, because uh, as we all know, and they have a Virgin Mary as a, let's say, default um, patron in any cases. So I would like to ask, how do you deal with that, with, with, with this problem, when you discuss the, uh, the, the patronage of, of Virgin Mary, both royal and, and aristocratic one? So yeah, that is a huge problem um, when you're looking at such a popular saint like the Virgin Mary. Um, I, the way I deal with it is by um, with saying a caveat that this is a possibility, but not maybe it's just happened that this guy likes the Virgin Mary and it's just the trend, so he, um, they dedicate uh, the church to him. However, sometimes um, it's more obvious, like through the murals or other things like this, that there is a connection to royal authority, like the Estergom Cathedral, where you have uh, the Virgin Mary enthroned and the giving the crown to her, and they're receiving it, um, the king's receiving it from the Virgin Mary. And there's another example of uh, that um, in the early 14th century in a, the Provost G Church of Sepeche, where Charles Robert, who's the new king, um, knew. Uh, after the death of the last Arpadian king, he becomes king and he starts to use the cult of the Virgin Mary in a more intense way and kind of copies the Estragon um, mural. And you find other examples where the holy kings of Hungary are pictured um, in murals with uh, the Virgin Mary. So there is a kind of, you can see it, sometimes there's a closer connection and sometimes there's not. Um, for the Cistercians, actually a, 
uh, interesting thing in Hungary is that even though I said they're so, so closely related to the Virgin Mary, and actually all the uh, female Cistercian monasteries in Hungary were dedicated to a different saint and not to the Virgin Mary, um, which was a, a weird situation. And maybe two of those churches were taken over um, from previous orders and they kind of uh, adopted the Patrocinia, but the other ones they did not. They just uh, decided to name um, their church after a different saint. So, yeah, the Cistercian order, they're making a deliberate choice, even so, um, to dedicate to Vary um, in Hungary. Yes, another question. If I can just, uh, to, just to follow. Uh, so, so uh, what you said, just to, to understand it correctly. So, so in Hungary, the, the Cistercian churches didn't have like a double patronage because in Poland, for example, usually they have Virgin Mary and some other saint. Uh, correct. Yes, all of, um, all of the, uh, most of the male churches were dedicated to the Virgin Mary, just Virgin Mary, but all of the um, uh, female ones were not, except for one that uh, adopted it from a Greek church that was already dedicated to Mary. So it's a weird thing, and apparently uh, that's sometimes something that just really happens kind of on the fringes of uh, the Cistercian order, and it's not common. Thank you. I have one question to Karin. Uh, do we have any information about who was actually composing these chants? Who was composing? Composer. Yes. Oh, now you get me going. This is so complicated. And I left that. The, the, the composing question is... Um, um, I'd really know where to start because this is so complicated. Um, there are, n because it has to do with that um, text and melody can't always be separated. The by far most common word known when it comes to m making music and text in Middle Ages is face it. So it's not to compose or compile or what it is. So we know, we know um, a few, I would say rather, milieu where um, offices have emerged rather than named composers, but there are a lot of named composers in medieval sources, and these are um, suspiciously often bishops or other people who very seldom had the time to, to um, compose offices. So I think that rather saints' offices are kind of um, a team activity at a chapter and then um, a, a bishop or another authority puts his name under it, and he can also be the initiator of the proje uh, project. If you didn't borrow the music and, and adapted it in s some ways, because that was also a way of, of composing, but that was not um, a bad thing to do. In, in some cases that can be even better to do. I mean, to borrow the music for, for St. Olaf from St. Augustine and Martin of Tours is a very good thing because then you have the role models there lying behind, they're giving him extra authority. So this is this very delicate interplay um, between text and music that also puts authority into a saint th by purely musical means. It's a very interesting and, and very complex question, but this is a very short answer. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, just uh, beginner's questions about the, about the offices. Um, are we... Um, more loudly, please. Uh, no, more loud. Um, are there any examples of uh, non-Latin uh, so vernacular texts being used in offices uh, from medieval Europe? No, the short answer is no. no. We have in general no vernacular text with music from the Scandinavian and Nordic Middle Ages. Yes. Uh, 
in connection to this question about the vernacular, um, how much did regular people understand what was happening when they um, participated in listening to an office? Like, who, were the, who was this for? Because if they couldn't understand the language, um, are they just have an understanding of it in some other way? The short answer is that it's for God. And this is, uh, we have to be aware of this concept, this is not performative in the context that they are doing it for an audience. And uh, next thing is that we also have to consider what does, it, what does understanding mean? Does it mean understanding in an intellectual sense that we understand all the words? Or is it the, the mystic experience that we understand or what is understanding? As, and as I uh, said in my paper, I, they didn't in general understand Latin. Of course, these, not these complicated texts from the from the Vita, um, but they understood that they were celebrating a saint, which they were familiar with. So I think we have to look at the concept of understanding from maybe another angle that we that we uh, think of. And they were popular, so some some understanding there was, of course. But it was, it was not participatory in that sense, but no liturgy was participatory in the Middle Ages. You, um, you were there, but you didn't participate in the way that we talk about participation. And that's also a very important thing to think about. So if there is no other question, I, I would like to, to ask Miłosz to, to develop a little bit what, what he said on the very end, because um, you mentioned two things which I, I, I think are very, very interesting from the point of view of, of legitimacy of, of elites or ecclesiastical institution, as well as I, underst I understood you. So, so first is that, um, that in a way, in the period you are, you are dealing with, um, the cult of St. Jill was a sort of a label to be a part of an elite in Poland. That's the one perspective, yes? You don't hear me. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so I will. I just, I just heard my name. <laughs> All right, so, so I will. No, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so so my, my question, I would like to ask you to develop the, the end of your or, or paper, in fact, because you just mentioned two things which I, I, I found very crucial for the the problem of the legitimization of, of elites. Uh, first, you, you mentioned this, this thing, which, if I understood you correctly, that, that in fact in the period we are dealing with, the, cult, the participation in the cult of St. Jill is a sort of a label of pre being a part of elites in, in, in Poland, if it's so. And, and another thing is um, the idea that in fact St. Jill, the monastery in Provence, used this fact that somewhere far away in the peripheries, the, there is a cult, which means that, you know, we have a really great, great saint who, so, so in a way, this is quite surprising way of, of, of legitimization when the, you know, very peripheral, because we, what we are usually have is that, you know, the saint, the, the, the saint from the center is used for the legitimization somewhere in the peripheries. Here, the peripheries might be used to legitimize, legitimize the center. So if you can, you know, simply develop this, this problem because you just mentioned that at the very sure. end. Okay, I, I'll, 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 I'll try. Um, well, the thing is that the, 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 that, um, the first thing is the martyrology, which, uh, which actually is nicely uh, put into tables and uh, uh, chapters by, by, uh, in this book by Vincer. And uh, what, he, what he says is very convincing, and this is, uh, this is something that I already talked about. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the mo more, more interesting thing is this narrative um, of miracles. And this really goes against, um, against the, the type of books of miracles that uh, are produced uh, at this time in France. Because usually about 80% of the 80% um, of the people visiting and asking for help are local, and they are they are usually asking for help for various medical reasons. And here you have a text in which 
the, those statistics are completely reversed. 80% of those uh, of those people visiting are from somewhere else. When you when you treat both those reductions together, it you know most of the people are from are outsiders from Provence. They are not from county of Toulouse. Of course, there are some examples, but they are mostly from Germany. And um, both those redactors rejoice in this. First, there is Peter William who says that, well, our Abbey is in trouble for some reason. He doesn't really explain what, what the trouble is, but, but there are bad people who want something from us. And this will console us that, that Giles works everywhere. Um, and so th th this, is, this, this is the reason why, why, why he is interested in those miracles. Uh, and the second one, the second redactor, I, I, I wasn't able to talk about this, the second redactor seems to be, and th this is not my discovery or anything, <laughs> uh, just, just the, uh, the editors of, 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 of the text, might have been German, actually. And he is very much interested in putting down all those miracles that happened in Germany, because he says, Giles, uh, well, well, people in Germany love Giles more than others. And this is the second part of the 12th century. They love him more than others, and this is why he, his miracle working is more active there. Uh, and here people forgot, uh, you know, what, what, what is it all uh, about. Um, so I, I'm not really sure if this answers your, your question a little bit. We might, maybe we will be able to be talk about it later. Yes. Are there any questions? No more. Well, uh, thank you, our lecturers. Thank you, the audience. And now, a coffee, coffee break.
find time to start the last uh, session of our today meeting. Uh, I have a great honor to, to chair this, this part of our conference. My name is Marcin Pauk. Uh, we had originally uh, scheduled four, uh, uh, sorry, three uh, papers in this part of our conference, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Jerzy Pysiak was forced to cancel his participation uh, due to health reasons, and uh, uh, probably his uh, paper will be delivered tomorrow uh, morning, but we are not sure uh, if, uh, if it will be uh, now. So, uh, we have uh, planned uh, two uh, papers, and the first one uh, uh, will present uh, Karolina Moravska. Uh, uh, she is uh, uh, project assistant, of course, in our uh, Norwegian-Polish uh, grant, uh, but uh, first of all, uh, she is also um, a PhD student uh, uh, on the Warsaw University, and. Uh, uh, he, uh, her research is uh, focused on the problems of uh, sexuality and gender in uh, medieval Poland. Uh, Karina Morawska is going to present the paper entitled The Cult of Saint Florian and the Legitimization of the Ducal Power in Kraków in the late 12th century. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will just make sure this thing works properly. Can you hear me? Well, okay. So, as you might have realized, uh, Saint Florian is not very closely related to sexuality and gender in medieval Poland. This is part of my older research. So, in 1184, the relics of Saint Florian were brought to Krakow, sorry for that, through the papal legate, legate Gilles, and this was a result of the efforts of Casimir the Just, the High Duke of Poland, and Bishop Getko of Krakow. The new patron was enthusiastically received, and his body was laid to rest in the Wawel Cathedral. And his cult spread fairly quickly, also outside Krakow. But before it had the chance to become popular all over Poland, an important rival appeared on the horizon, Saint Stanislaus. The success of the Bishop, Bishop of Krakow, crowned with his canonization, made the cult of St. Florian largely disappear for many years. And the reasons behind the failure to popularize the cult of St. Florian have been repeatedly discussed by Polish scholars, and my aim was also to establish whether this was simply an unsuccessful import and therefore the decline of the cult was only a matter of time. Mm -hmm or whether a lack of support from the lay or church authorities contributed to its failure, or whether despite its initial success, the cult of St. Florian came up against an obstacle it could not overcome. Uh, another interesting question is that of the motivation guiding the High Duke when he brought the saint to Poland, as well as the political background of the events in question. So the sources tell us relatively little about the translation of uh, the saint and the growth of his cult in Poland. The translation of the relics to Krakow is mentioned by nearly all Polish annals. The time frame extends from 1183 to 1197, with the most likely year being 1184, given by the annals of the Krakow chapter, a source closest to the events, both in terms of the place and time. So please have a look at its record. Uh, the existence of the cult of St. Florian is attested by Master Vincentius' early 13th century chronicle, although he does not give us any other information about the martyr brought to Krakow, which is puzzling because we are dealing with a source not very distant in time from the analyzed events. The circumstances of the translation of St. Florian and the reception of the martyr in Krakow were described in greater detail only by Jan Dugos in his annals, in the second half of the 15th century, as you can see. Let us refer at this point to his account. According to Dugos, a request to donate relics of some saint was submitted to Pope Alexander III by Casimir the Just. Alexander's successor, Pope Lucius III, granted the request. And when the Pope entered the crypt where bodies of many martyrs were buried, he asked which of them would like to go to Poland. 
And upon these words, from the tomb where the body of Florian had been laid to rest, there stretched out a hand with the saint thus giving the Pope a sign that he, could be given, he should be given to the Poles and the Krakow Cathedral. So the account indicates that the Pope was not asked for any particular body and the choice was made by Saint Florian himself, a fact confirmed by the miracle. Okay, so not yet. This, uh, does, there were most likely no specific expectations concerning the person of the new patron. The remains chosen were those to which Pope Lucius III, who spent almost the whole of his reign in exile outside Rome because of a conflict with the city's inhabitants, had the easiest access. So the Polish delegation may have found him in Modena, Florence, or most likely in Bologna, but establishing Florian's identity is a matter of secondary importance to us, and I will not dwell on it further, nor will I analyze the details of the actual translation of the relics to Krakow. Instead, I will concentrate on the political background of the events in question. If Casimir the Just and his entourage did not care about acquiring a specific saint, let us consider what generated the demand for relics during his reign. Let us leave aside the obvious motives that always guided rulers seeking to acquire the remains of patron saints. Um, in the second half of the 12th century, Poland saw a marked revival of the tendency to possess holy relics, but in the case of the translation of Saint Florian, the reasons were much more complex. We should bear in mind that the late 12th century was a period of fragmentation of the Polish realm, as well as um, rivalry between two strong centers, Gniezno, which lost its central status as a result of the crisis of the monarchy of the first Piaz in the uh, 1030s, and Krakow, where Duke Casimir the Restorer focused his activities when rebuilding the Piast monarchy after its collapse. And the elevation of Krakow above the capitals of other provinces came with the status of Bolesław de Rymow, who in his act of succession of 1138 made the city the main capital of the, of the Polish state. And it would soon turn out that possessing Krakow was more important in this order of succession than seniority within the dynasty. After the overthrowing of Mieszko the Old in Krakow, which was tantamount to a breach of the senior, senioral principle, the power of High Duke was taken over by Casimir the Just and his rule was recognized throughout the realm a state of affairs confirmed at the 1180 Congress of Wenchica. Okay, thus, towards the end of the 12th century, there were two nearly equal rival political centers, Krakow and Gniezno. The latter suffered greatly during the invasion of Duke Bratislav, who carried off the remains of St. Adalbert, but it was subsequently rebuilt and became a ducal seat. Seeking to be on a par with the city, which had, be, had been the resting place of St. Adalbert, Krakow could not therefore be without its own patron saint. And it is this interpretation, so pointing to political motives which prevails among Polish scholars. Both Duke Casimir and Bishop Getka of Krakow were interested in creating a counterbalance to the cult of St. Adalbert and Lesser Poland, represented by Mieszko the Old, whose ambitions and pretensions posed a constant threat to the High Duke. So Getko uh, additionally sought to strengthen the significance of Krakow and the position of the Bishop of Krakow in the Polish Church. These objectives were to be achieved through the use of the cults of saints, first Florian and then Stanislaus. Florian's translation at the time would legitimize the new order introduced at the Congress of Wenchica that I mentioned, which approved Casimir as the High Duke. It seems, however, that the Duke may have had other objectives in addition to wanting to gain an advantage over Gniezno. The translation may have been a measure preventing the potential rise of the cult of Saint Stanislaus and the idea of his canonization, which may have been forming in the minds of the members of the Krakow chapter at the time already. And in order to verify this thesis, it is worth taking a look at the beginning of the cult of Saint Florian in Krakow. After reaching the city, the new patron was received with great ceremony amidst signs of general rejoicing by Duke Casimir, Bishop Getko of Krakow, and the population. And this is according to Dugos, who was convinced that the ceremony simply could not have gone any other way. 
and the relics were then carried in a mass procession to the Krakow Cathedral and placed in a main altar. In addition, we know that Bishop Getko built a church for the saint outside Krakow's walls in Klepasz. It was cons uh, cons uh, consecrated in 1185 and St. Florian's arm was placed there. According to one of the, of the three versions, um, the so-called Lesser Poland version of the Translatio Sancti Floriani, the saint himself stopping the cart on which his remains were carried at one point apparently indicated the place where the church was to be built. It was there that he wanted to be laid to rest in order to be able to defend this part of the city. The Klepasz Foundation is of particular importance in the present analysis precisely because the church was located extra civitatem, so outside the city walls, which was a sign of special cult. Calendar records show that from the moment of the translation, the 4th May was celebrated in Krakow as Festum Fori, that is a feast of uh, obligation not only for the church, but also for the society at large, so another indicator of high veneration. Another factor confirming the great importance of the new patron saint was the spread of the cult beyond the Krakow Cathedral. I have already mentioned the foundation of the church in Klepasz, but there was also the Kopszewnica Monastery, dedicated to St. Florian in the same year. Importantly, it was also connected with the propagation of the new order in Poland, the Cistercians, and the Duke immediately took the monastery under his wings. In addition, a particle from St. Florian's relics was placed in the monastery church. Another success of St. Florian on Polish soil was the ado adoption by his cult by society, a fact evidenced above all by the appearance of the name Florian in the catalogue of Polish baptismal names, which is also confirmed in the chronicle by Długosz. And this undoubtedly testifies to the fame that the new patron gained, especially as his name had previously been unknown in Poland. So it is clear that the initial stage in the veneration of the new patron was um, an era of glory. There is nothing surprising about this, given that the Krakow had not previously had a patron saint of its own. And the importation of, importation of Florian was a response to a huge demand for holy relics. Initially, the cult was local in nature, centering around the Krakow Cathedral and the tomb of St. Florian, with the churches in Klepasz and Kopszewnica Monastery, according secondary places of cult. The Feast of St. Florian, on the other hand, which had an octave, became obligatory for the whole diocese from the very beginning. Uh, Hagiotoponyms of St. Florian were later uh, given two elements of Krakow's urban space, so the Florian Gate, mentioned for the first time in 1307 and St. Florian Street. Unfortunately for the newly established cult of St. Florian, it did not take long for a new patron saint to emerge. The moment considered as marking the end of the glory days of the cult is the year 1253, when Bishop Stanislaus of Krakow was canonized. The clergy's energetic activity pushed the cult of St. Florian into the background. Although, as I have mentioned, some scholars want to see the translation of St. Florian as a failed experiment which stood no chance of success in Poland, we may wonder how the cult would have developed further if nothing had dis disrupted it. In order to answer these questions, we need to take a closer look at the rise of the cult of St. Stanislaus, a bishop and a martyr whose death was apparently caused by King Bolesław the Generous. The first information about the conflict between the bishop and the king can be found in Gallus Anonymous' work, although it does not give us any details about the bishop, not even his name. Gallus wrote his chronicle about 30 years after the end of Boleslav the Generous' reign, which is why we could expect a detailed account from him. However, the chronicler evidently shies away from giving details of the conflict, limiting himself to stating that the king as anointed by God, should not have punished another anointed man corporally for any sin. Gallus' position must have been the same as the position of the episcopate and the court in Boleslav de Rymau's times. A much more detailed account of the conflict between the Bishop of Krakow and Boleslav the Generous was included by Master Vincentius in his chronicle. He describes in details how Bishop Stanislav of Krakow stood up against royal tyranny and as a result was sentenced to death, truncatio membrorum, uh, no, uh, sorry, 
um, this is not exactly what he says, because um, uh, to be precise, um, Kadubek says that uh, the king uh, killed the bishop himself. So I will tell you why this will be explained in a minute. Uh, a detailed account of the killing of the bishop written down over 100 years after the events in question was not a coincidence. An answer lies in the biography of Kadubek, who studied in Paris in the 1170s. This was a time of widespread discussions about the death of Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the issue of his death, canonization, and cult was particularly vociferously commented on in Paris. And the description of the murder of Bishop Stanislaus is quite similar to the circumstances of Thomas Beckett's death, and it is highly likely that Kadubek was inspired by Beckett's case. It was precisely on the pages of Kadubek's chronicle that the cult of the martyred bishop was born. So in fact, the canonization of Saint Stanislaus happened thanks to the victory of the Gregor Gregorian reform in Europe and its gradual reception in Poland. And from this perspective, Kadubek's silence on the translation of Saint Florian ceases to surprise us. It was most likely caused by the chronicl chronicler's desire to spread the cult of Saint Stanislaus. So mentioning the success of St. Florian and his reception in Krakow would undoubtedly have created competition for the cult of Stanislaus, a state of affairs which Kadubek probably wanted to avoid. It is easy to understand why Kadubek wanted so much to see the cult of St. Stanislaus grow. The cult was an ideal tool to make Krakow stand out among the Polish bishoprics, something that members of the cathedral chapter had sought for a long time and their efforts resulted in the papal ball by Pope Urban III from 1186. In the document, the Pope guaranteed the Church of Krakow the first place after the archbishopric, and the Bishop of Krakow received the right, to, the right of precedence over other Polish bishops. And it is interesting why Casimir, the High Duke, would try to bring down, an, to bring an unknown foreign patron to the city if the legend of the holiness of the local bishop was already beginning to spread in Krakow's ecclesiastical circles. The Duke may not have been at all keen on the growth of the cult of the Bishop of Krakow, who had probably taken part in the rebellion against his great-grandfather, the bishop whose uh, case may have ultimately contributed to the exile of Bolesław the Generous, and the bishop whose milieu was by all indications hostile to the reigning monarch. So this is all the more likely given that in Casimir the Just's times, there existed two versions of the conflict between the bishop and the king, one cultivated by the church, the other by the court circles, which, as a lot of evidence shows, did not condemn Bolesław the Generous at all. Bolesław was remembered as a ruler deserving respect and prayer, not as a murderer of the bishop of Krakow. Thus, we have numerous reasons to believe that Casimir the Just did not share the conviction of churchmen concerning the holiness of Bishop Stanislaus, and that all the steps he took to bring the relics of a foreign patron were intended as a move to stop the fledgling cult of the Bishop of Krakow. Uh, the city was to acquire its own patron who, as the Duke probably wished, would fully satisfy the demand for a holy protector and reign in the aspirations of members of the cathedral chapter. Duke Casimir was an ardent follower of the cult of Saint Florian. After returning from the 1194 expeditions against the Jodzwingians, he devoted a lot of time to praying and thanksgiving. The celebrations involved the entire court, Bishop Pełka of Krakow, as well as Bishop Witt of Płock. The fact that the day of Saint Florian was chosen to give thanks is an indicator of high veneration. Feasting was postponed to the following day as the Florian celebrations were serious and solely devotional in nature. Unfortunately, Saint Florian would soon lose the zealous guardian of his cult. After a day spent on devotions to the holy patron, Duke Casimir died during a feast uh, on the 5th May 1190, uh, 1194. However, contrary to the intentions of the propagators of the sainthood of Florian's rival, the cult of the martyr brought to Krakow did not die out completely as, a, as the cult of Saint Stanislaus grew. For example, Kazimierz Dobrowolski, one of the Polish researchers, pointed out to a 
1220 diploma in which Bishop Ivo approves tith endowments to the Mstuf monastery of canons regular. What is significant <coughs> is the formula before the altar of St. Florian. It suggests that the bishop and the chapter gathered before the tomb of St. Florian to perform central, uh, certain legal acts. As such legal acts were performed before the most sacred element in the cathedral, this was, as Dobrovolsky notes, a huge honor for Florian. Significantly, the information sounds like a random reference from a chronicle, and presumably similar activities often took place by the tomb of St. Florian. The growth of the cult of St. Stanislaus began, as I said, an era of a gradual decline of the cult of St. Florian. The Krakow Cathedral became the main site of the cult of its bishop, and all other cults of saints were pushed into the background. Florian stood no chance against such a strong rival. Stanislaus met all the criteria of becoming a patron saint of the nation. First, he was a Pole and a bishop of Krakow. Second, there was a legend glorifying his life. And just as importantly, all families with a sense of kinship with the bishop could take part in the development of his cult. Florian had no links to the land where he was venerated, nor could he uh, had served as a model if his passion was unknown. It is understandable that, given the circumstances surrounding the Pope's gift of St. Florian relics, no legend celebrating his martyrdom may, may have reached Krakow. A vita of St. Florian reached Poland much later, only in the mid-14th century. It was associated with several Florians with, who had no vita on their own. On the basis of the above analysis, we cannot agree that the cult of St. Florian did not take root in Poland and that its disappearance was only a matter of time. Nor can we agree that the experiment with an unknown foreign scent failed and would not have developed even without competition from St. Stanislaus. The reigning duke played a major role in promoting the cult of the important saint. And shortly after the translation, several foundations dedicated to St. Florian were established. And finally, his cult was reflected in society, in the naming of new newborn children after Florian, and in the numerous pilgrimages to his tomb and the belief in his healing powers. The cult of Florian would probably have taken root more deeply in Poland and spread widely if it had not begun to be suppressed so early in order to make room for a rival, a predecessor of the bishops of Krakow. A foreign saint, saint stood no chance against such a rival, especially after the death of one of his most, most ardent protectors, so the Duke Casimir. And a particularly telling manifestation of the suppression of the cult of St. Florian was the designation of <clears throat> the 8th of May, so a day within the octave after the Feast of Florian as the day of celebration in honor of Stanislaus. And uh, in short, after years of partial oblivion, the cult of St. Florian was revived in the 15th century thanks to the work of Zbigniew Oleśnicki. Article 4 of the Oleśnicki status stated of uh, 1436 was devoted exclusively to Florian. Uh, in it, the bishop, together with his chapter, decided to make the veneration of the famous martyr and their patron equal to that of St. Stanislaus. So thus, the 4th May was included among the Festa Dupitia and began to be recognized again as a festum fori throughout the diocese, not only in Krakow. And so, thank you very much. And uh, our next lecturer is uh, Karsti Day, uh, teaching fellow in medieval history at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, her uh, research interests are focused on, uh, similarly, like Caroline, uh, Carolina, on uh, female uh, religiosity, gender, and uh, Francisca Franci Franciscan movement in the central Europe. Uh, the lecture will be uh, online. Oh, hello. So the Hi, floor, uh, the floor is yours. Um, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Apologies. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that kind introduction. 
um, and also to the organisers uh, for inviting me to take part in this fantastic conference. I'm very sorry not to be there in person, unfortunately, during uh, due to uh, partly the university uh, placing some restrictions on travel and on some unexpected work commitments. Um, I wasn't able to be there and I've, I'm very sorry not to have met, uh, met you all. I've been listening to the papers I've been able to listen to and I've, I've enjoyed them very much. Um, so I have a PowerPoint, I will just load that up. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I can't. Ah, here we go. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, uh, yeah, the paper that I'm going to talk about today is titled The Legitimization of Ecclesiastical Power in 13th Century East Central Europe, uh, Elizabeth of Hungary in Bohemia and the Polish Duchies. So the Thuringian Langravine and Hungarian Princess Elizabeth of Hungary died in 1231 and was canonized by Pope Gregory IX in 1235. Elizabeth came to symbolize the practice of violent hatred of the world through extreme bodily mortification in the 13th century, as well as the abandonment both of the icons of royal power and of obedience to this same form of power. The hagiographic testimony offered up by Elizabeth's handmaids for her canonization dossier reads that her confessor, the notorious inquisitor Conrad of Marburg, motivated by good zeal, would lash and beat her if she were disobedient towards him. Prior to the death of her husband, Elizabeth took Conrad as her confessor. One day she had been detained on royal duty and was unable to attend a sermon of Conrad's. He refused as a result to administer any pastoral care to her. And when Elizabeth begged for forgiveness, he ordered Elizabeth and her handmaids to strip down to their shirts and soundly whipped them. The hagiographic Elizabeth's submission to her confessor was, in other words, accompanied by a contemptuous mundi expressed through harm to her own body. Elizabeth was one of many East Central European holy women whose religious lives and afterlives wove together the royal authority embodied in the idea of the, by the holy bloodline and the simultaneous rejection of this power and authority. The cults of Elizabeth of Hungary and the other East Central European royal women who turned away from the splendor of royalty to take on these harsh forms of penance have been studied extensively, of course, most notably by Garbel Klanitzai. These cults' existence have been studied as the product of the women's religious movement, the influence of the mendicant orders, currents of lay-driven piety, and the divine legitimization of royal power. These cults have not so far, at least not on a grand scale, formed part of the story of the papacy's attempt to legitimize its power and a papally prescribed orthodoxy in East Central Europe and beyond. So in this paper, I'm not going to challenge radically the existing scholarship and the evidence that I present will be incredibly familiar to many of you. And I think that a number of the papers today have, have already touched on um, a lot of similar themes. Um, so I, this should, should be very um, familiar. Um, I do want to argue, however, that in, in favor of writing the papacy and its project of constructing orthodoxy more firmly into the story of the formation of these women's cults. Reframing the narrative to include the vested interests that the popes had in promoting the cults of holy women like Elizabeth is a productive way both of reading the evidence for these cults and for understanding the legitimization of papal power in the 13th century. Using examples from papal letters and hagiography, I demonstrate how the papacy both shaped and used the reputation of holy women, uh, these holy women to legitimize its own power. I focus initially on the papal promotion of the cult of Elizabeth of Hungary before analyzing the Elizabeth effect uh, in the case of two other Central European women, Agnes of Bohemia in more detail and Anna of Silesia uh, just in brief. I define cult building quite broadly in the paper. Uh, Gregory IX in particular was prone to viewing holy women as saints during their lifetime and made a uh, 
a concerted attempt to get in on the ground level, as it were. Uh, so I think that it's important to analyse how he inserted the papacy into the narrative of women like Agnes of Bohemia, uh, in particular from an early stage in her life. So the decision made by these women to reject the icons of royal power was, of course, surely tantalising for the papacy, not least because they lived in close proximity to the German lands, one of the central arenas of the conflict between papacy and empire. And of course, these women still retained ties with their families and their families' vast power and wealth, uh, a tension that has formed a central question in previous examinations of these cults. But these women's symbolic rejection of the trappings of royalty and power had a genuine cultural purchase that was both shaped by and left space for papal intervention in the cult's development. In 1235, Pope Gregory IX wrote to Beatrice, the Queen of Castile. The daughter of Philip of Swabia and originally named Elizabeth herself, Beatrice became the Queen of Castile on her marriage to Fred Ferdinand III of Castile. Gregory had written to Beatrice to recommend Elizabeth of Hungary in the highest terms. It's not easy to tell from the letter whether the letter is a response to Beatrice's request for spiritual instruction or whether Gregory sent the letter unprompted and Beatrice died shortly after the letter was sent, so we're, we're lacking a little bit of context here. Um, but the majority of the letter is a mystical paean to Elizabeth's newly ratified sanctity. In his letter, Gregory praised Elizabeth for inspiring two people to convert to religious life. Agnes of Bohemia, the Bohemian princess turned Franciscan nun, uh, all, along with Conrad of Thuringia, who became the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights in Marburg. Uh, Gregory actually writes the, use, the word that he uses is that she had intoxicated them. Scholars have typically used this letter as evidence for Elizabeth's inspiration of Agnes. Read in its context, however, the letter tells us much more than this. By praising Elizabeth's inspiration of Agnes and Conrad in his letter to Beatrice, the Pope inserted himself into this narrative of inspiration. Both Agnes and Conrad had taken on forms of penance which were quite different from each other's uh, and also from Elizabeth's. What is consistent across all three, however, is that they'd all run away from the trappings of royal power and towards the crucified, as Gregory the Ninth puts it. Uh, Agnes, for instance, had run away from the lofty vestiges of imperial power as one would from a snake's venom, uh, seizing the banner of the triumphal cross and advancing in the way of her spouse towards the chorus of holy virgins. Agnes had rejected, of course, the marriage proposal of the Emperor Frederick II to become a nun. And as well as being this uh, symbolic of her devotion to poverty, the rejection of imperial power was also a particularly powerful symbol for the papacy. Gregory likely mentioned Agnes and Conrad in particular because one purpose of the letter was, of course, to provide Beatrice with spiritual inspiration. And so, it would have been prudent of the Pope to refer to figures with whom Beatrice would have been familiar. Um, moreover, a saint's charisma is always, of course, attested to in part by their followers, regardless of papal interest. Um, it's perhaps an, an obvious point. However, Gregory also aligns the papacy closely with this group of Central East European holy people, Praised by the papacy, the conversion of Elizabeth, Agnes and Conrad away from royal life was also a conversion to a realm over which the Pope claimed supreme authority. Gregory inserts the papacy into the narrative as a way of legitimizing uncompromising obedience to papal power over the temptation of imperial prestige, which would become an increasingly central tenet of orthodoxy during the pontificates of Gregory and his successor Innocent IV. Elizabeth's charisma is the vehicle for the narrative of renunciation of royal and imperial power, and so also implicitly obedience to the church. As Diane Elliott has argued, Elizabeth of Hungary's extreme submission to her confessor, Conrad of Marble, became a symbol of orthodoxy in the 13th century. 
Barred from ordination, argues Eliot, women were quintessentially lay, and so the dynamic between confessor and female penitent that was most famously represented by Elizabeth and Conrad's relationship became a symbol of the commission of one's will to the church and the spurning of temporal power and authority. Um, we see this in the example from her canonization dossier that I mentioned in the introduction to this paper, in which Elizabeth is punished by Conrad specifically for attending to her royal duties instead of attending his sermon. Elizabeth's sanctity was investigated using methods of inquiry similar to those employed by inquisitors into heretical depravity, an office that had been established at around the same time as Elizabeth's canonization process. With reference to the work of Pierre-André Segal, uh, Klanetzai has argued that inquisitorial interest in the cults of saints added to the miraculous dynamic of their cults. In other words, the very process of interrogation by a papal representative added to the charisma of a saint's cult. In this way, the process of cult building and the legitimization of papal monopoly over the canonization process went hand in hand. As this is not really the purpose of her book, Eliot does not situate Elizabeth in a central or East Central European context, and so the relationships that the Pope builds with Central European women especially do not feature very heavily in her text. Although it is perhaps an obvious point, though, I think it's notable that what was perhaps a more rigid sense of orthodoxy and one more closely connected to obedience to the papacy was promulgated most powerfully through the cults of East Central European women at least from the papacy's point of view. This has been a little under-examined, uh, under in part because these women's stories have often been told as part of the history of the mendicant orders, um, particularly the women that I'll be talking about today. Um, the Pope is often an oppositional figure in these narratives, one who is monomaniacally fixated on curbing the Franciscan spiritual freedoms, although this, uh, this intellectual culture is, of course, changing. But this is perhaps especially true of histories of Franciscan women. Um, the Pope is often uh, quite an evil figure in, in these uh, narratives. And so viewing the histories of the orders and the papacy as one and the same, um, feels a bit awkward. But much of these women's stories are told through papal documents and hagiography written at the behest of the Pope or for the Pope's approval. And the papacy was as heavily reliant on these women's obedience as these women were on the papacy's protection and permission. They were, as we've been uh, discussing in other papers today, uh, mutually dependent. And I think to ignore this is to reduce these women's histories as exemplary figures rather than as central to the 13th century papacy's project of orthodoxy. As Monica Sechinska Verkhama has argued with reference to the 14th and 15th centuries, the old historiographical narrative of the East Central European rulers' reliance on the papacy has failed to take account of the fact that the papacy were also very reliant on East Central European rulers. And I think that we see much of the same in the papacy's close alignment with the holy women of these regions uh, in the 13th century as well. Perhaps because of the popularity of Elizabeth's cult, Gregory IX began to ally himself with Central European from a very uh, with Central European holy women um, from a very early stage in their careers. I mentioned previously the Pope's praise of Agnes's rejection of Frederick II's marriage proposal. Agnes was praised by Gregory IX and also by Claire of Assisi for rejecting the worldly riches that she would have received upon accepting Frederick's offer of marriage, for, spur for spurning the glimmer of temporal wealth in favour of tre treasures in heaven. This narrative of marriage rejection was, of course, very common in the way in which the lives of holy women were written. But Agnes was meant to be married to one of the most powerful men in Christendom and someone who was ostensibly meant to be the defender of the faith and of the Pope. When Gregory praised Agnes for joining a monastic community instead of enjoying the temporal splendor that she would have been afforded by marriage to Frederick II, he also reduced the purpose of the empire to a symbol of the temporal. 
Frederick as emperor did not play a role in defending the faith in this narrative, but was simply a stand-in for the temporal and all that would perish. The animosity harbored by Gregory towards Frederick comes through here, and Agnes's rejection of him becomes not only a rejection of the temporal, but of a papal opponent. Gregory wrote Agnes's rejection not only of marriage then, but of the power that was most diametrically opposed to the papacy and which he saw as the largest threat to papal supremacy into Agnes's conversion narrative from an early stage. This did, however, make papal legitimacy in the Bohemian royal court heavily dependent on Agnes's continued obedience. Agnes became a nun during a time at which the papacy was trying to impose a particularly strict form of enclosure upon women religious. There were aspects of this, however, to which she was opposed. The strictures of enclosure meant that Agnes could not hear the mass or see the priest celebrating it. Gregory wrote to Agnes on the 4th of April, 1237, to grant her a five-year dispensation that would allow her to modify her surroundings so that she could see the mass being celebrated. So clearly Agnes had asked for the enclosure-based arrangement to which she had agreed to be modified. And this happens in various other forms as well. Um, and on the 9th of May, 1238, Gregory eventually wrote to Agnes to exhort her to sing the praises of the enclosed monastic life that she had chosen. The implication being that Agnes had expressed a growing frustration with it and had tried um, to break free of it. When Innocent IV came to power, he also found himself having frequently to ensure, uh, ensure that Agnes continued to follow an enclosed monastic life and to offer concessions to Agnes. The papacy had seized early upon the cults that had begun to grow around Agnes in her own lifetime, but doing so meant that it was beholden to Agnes's needs. If Agnes were to stop being a nun, then this would bring the papacy's conception uh, of orthodoxy into question. This is not to argue, of course, that the women were completely free to do what they wanted uh, because they were royal women. As I mentioned previously, women's obedience to their confessors was another vessel through which papal power was legitimized. And we see this in the Vita of Anna of Silesia, the Bohemian princess and Silesian duchess who, like Elizabeth, form, uh, followed a form of penitential life on the death of her husband. Uh, a Vita of Anna of Silesia was written in around the year 1330. Uh, this was only very short and not a hagiography in the strictest sense, it's rather an appraisal of a pious laywoman. But this perhaps makes it more striking when we notice how much of the text is punctuated by the stress placed by the author on Anna's obedience to the friars who lived within her court. Like Conrad of Marburg's role in Elizabeth's life, the friars loom over Anna, Anna and her husband while she is still alive, and she's completely submissive to them after her husband's death. At one point when she's about to build a convent for women in her court, the friars strongly object and she had to get down on her knees and beg them for acceptance. Even though Anna was still able to exercise degrees of real power after her husband's death, as Sebastian Rossignol has demonstrated in his study of her wills, and even though she had the power of her sons on her side who still looked after her interests, she had to be portrayed as submitting to the will of the friars, even though they were heavily reliant on her financial support. Now, although the friars are not the papacy, uh, as inquisitors and confessors, the friars were, particularly by this time, seen very much as agents of the papacy. Royal women's performance of obedience uh, was clearly still important to conceptions of orthodoxy almost 100 years after Elizabeth was canonised. So to conclude very briefly, uh, lacking time, I've described this process of legitimization in quite a top-down way and with only a few examples. Um, and I think that there are a number of further questions that need to be asked of this material. Did the cults that formed around uh, East Central European noble and royal women actually help to cement papal legitimacy in East Central Europe and beyond? And how indeed would we measure this? 
But I think that the papacy at least attempted to use these cults as a vehicle for the legitimization of papal power. And, and I think that this is worth stating. Um, although the importance of these cults to the narrative of 13th century religion have been emphasized time and time again, the implications for the Pope's conception and promotion of orthodoxy uh, of the control that the papacy tried to assert over these women's narratives have perhaps not been as fully re realized. Popes like Gregory IX knew that there was a great deal of power imbued in, even in the age old trope of rejecting high status marriage. And this had particular cultural purchase in a climate in which powerful rulers like the emperor were perceived by Gregory as the greatest threat to papal supremacy over the church. Reframing the narrative to include this kind of papal interest brings out how central cults of East Central European were to the construction of, and promotion of papal power and of orthodoxy. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty, uh, and uh, I would like to thank you both for, uh, lecturers for the discipline and very interesting papers. So we have heard two papers concerning uh, vital aspects of uh, East Central European religious culture and promotion of foreign cults also. So uh, uh, we shall start uh, discussions. So feel free to, to ask the questions uh, at, uh, and the remarks. Yes, please. We have uh, enough time to discuss. Grzegorz, please. Um, so I have a question to Karolina. Um, maybe f first a, a remark. Uh, there is, in fact, quite quite interesting um, um, source to the to the cult of Saint Florian, which is, as, as you know, miracle surprisingly, miracles of Saint Stanislaus, which which mentioned that some pilgrims came to to Saint Florian asking for being healed, but unfortunately, St. Florian didn't manage to do that, so they asked St. Stanislaus. And, uh, you know, after, after listening to your, your, your paper, I was start to think that whenever I, I read this, this source, I always thought that this is just, just a story about um, being healed by St. Stanislaus, a way to say that our patron is, is the best, simply speaking. But do you think that it's possible that this uh, that it was written down in purpose, not to generally say that St. Stanislaus is better than other saints, but to say, following your, your idea, that he's better particularly than St. Florian. And, uh, and another question, if, if, if I may, uh, there is, there is, I, I would like to ask how, how would you respond to, to, to that. Uh, there is one, one problem with, with this idea that it was, uh, that the translation was in fact a very much ducal idea that, um, as well as I know, the older sources stress that it was a uh, bishop involved in it. And I would like also to, to, to ask in, in what moment was the, uh, in the sources, uh, Duke appeared as one of the author, one of the, one, one of those who organized the, the canonization. The, the translation, of course, sorry. Please, uh, Anna Driblak. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, thank you for this question. Sorry for that, it's moving. I just wanted you to hear me properly. Uh, so, thank you for this question, and it's really uh, very important because uh, this is something I found important but just decided to throw it out of my paper as I considered it already too long. So um, it's, it's a great thing that you mentioned it because, in fact, it is true that in the third part of, um, of Vita of, um, of uh, Saint Stanislaus, there is a mention, that there is a miracle uh, with a young girl who's, uh, who was paralyzed and she came to Krakow on the day of Saint Florian to ask for help. So already this is something, even if, as you said, um, 
there was a purpose in saying that Stanislaus, our patron, is the best. Yes, it's and the other, the others are powerless. Uh, so, even if it was on purpose, it, the fact that um, there was a normal, there was a tradition, still living tradition, to of asking Saint Florian for help is uh, really striking. So uh, the girl came to St. Florian to ask for help, but she wasn't healed until she chose to uh, come to the grave of St. Stanislaus. So yes, as you said, the author wanted to, uh, clearly wanted to show the healing power of St. Stanislaus, but it is, very, uh, it is very important that just marginally he mentioned that there was a still living tradition of uh, of making pilgrimages to the to the grave of Saint Florian and he was also he was still an authority and he was still a saint considered to have some healing uh, powers so this is very important and I think yes I think maybe it was on purpose uh, it was um, it was not accidental uh, it had to it, it was supposed to uh, to show the, uh, the power of Stanislaus. But in the same time, we have the, another very important evidence of the cult of Saint Florian still being alive. Uh, as for your second question, uh, was the question really when does the bishop appear in the sources? The, uh, the duke. Okay, so to be, to be precise, you know. Uh, so, uh, mm, I don't know if it will be visible. Okay, never mind. So, as I said in the annals of the, um, of the chapter, there is a mention that Florian was, uh, Sanctus Florianus uh, per egidium episcopum, mm -hmm, et per getconum episcopum. Okay, so we have no mention about the, about the duke there. Uh, the, the earliest annals are consistent with each other and are very, their records are very similar to this relation. So, um, I, you know, it's, I find it really important, but I didn't really consider it before when the Duke appears for the first time. But uh, he, sh he exists already in the in the narrative by Dugosh, which is a late one, as I said. But it also uh, Dugosh might have used in a, uh, the story I mentioned shortly, Translatio Sancti Floriani, uh, that uncovers the details. So maybe this was this was why. I'll keep my I'll keep searching because I have all the. Um, records of the annals here, and I don't think they mentioned the Duke, but just to be sure, if I find something, I will let you know. Thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, I have a question to uh, Excuse me, day. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. Uh, I understand that you are talking about uh, creation of um, of a model in in hagiography in hagiographical sources. Uh, and I would like to ask: uh, Didn't you think about confronting uh, this image uh, with uh, uh, with the um, material with the image of uh, Duchess's relations with papal and ecclesiastical authority? Uh, in uh, um, in the diplomatic sources from 13th century, uh, I believe the image might be quite different, and uh, that this confrontation uh, might give uh, uh, this comparison might give uh, very interesting uh, results. Please answer at once. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. that. Is it okay to go ahead and answer? Yeah, okay. Um, I, so, uh, yes, so as far as I understood your question, um, you were asking, would it be interesting uh, not just to look at um, the hagiographic model, but also kind of at the diplomatic sources to see how this, uh, this plays out? 
Um, yeah, I think I think it would absolutely be very interesting. I've, uh, I've presented kind of a, a slightly monolithic, <laughs> despite arguing against uh, a, a slightly kind of monolithic um, presentation of how these women are often kind of promoted um, on a local level. Um, I've presented quite a monolithic narrative of how, why they were um, of interest uh, to the papacy. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that um, looking at some of the diplomatic sources, it helps to it helps to sort of nuance um, the way in which, yet yeah, not only uh, the 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 narrative that the papacy tried to kind of graft onto kind of these women's lives, but also the way in which. Um, the women kind of respond, or the women in question, the duchesses and, and princesses in question, respond to um, what's, yeah, to, yeah, what what is happening, the the kinds of image that is being grafted onto them. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I think that would be a, an interesting, um, interesting direction for for further study. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, any other claims? Any other voices? Yes, yes, please. Miłosz Sosnowski. I have a question to, to Carolina um, about Florian. What, uh, what sort of ideological content do you think? Because we don't have any sources for that. Uh, could Florian have for the for the prince um, uh, if it was pushed by by, by Kazimierz, uh, what what were the contents of this of this cult to pacify the ecclesiastical institutions in Krakow or I mean I, I'm I'm trying to think about that also this is um, and, and if it didn't work, what were the forces against it uh, in, in Krakow? Thank you. Excuse me, because I'm not sure if I understood your question properly. What were the, not the motivations of the high duke, but what was exactly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, to be honest, me too, I'd like to know the answer to this question, because uh, as we know, it was um, simply a good thing to bring a foreign patron saint, a Roman saint. It was always a very powerful thing to do for a duke. But as I said, maybe the fact that it actually lacked some deeper ideological motives caused Saint Stanislaus to gain um, to gain power m more quickly because, as I said, and as you know very well, there was no Vita of Saint Florian in the time. It only appeared uh, in Poland in the middle of 14th century, and it was a life that was simply associated with each Florian without uh, a Vita on his own, S and it was. Um, the Vita is about um, a Roman soldier uh, f from the turn of the centuries of third and fourth century uh, who was a martyr who died because of uh, Christian faith. So uh, I don't, we, we don't really have enough sources, I think, in order to consider whether there was whether this ideology and, and the history of uh, a really a random saint imported to Poland, if there was something, uh, on per if, if the Duke has something in his mind, yes, on how the cult should be created and how which particular traits of the saints should be used in, in order to enforce his power. But this is a very important question, I think. Thank you. And any other voices? I don't see. Uh, so let me add some, one, one remark. Grzegorz, once again. Okay, please. 
Just, just one question to, to Kirsty. Um, because uh, as well as I, uh, I understood you, you, you present um, the papal authority mainly, but, but you also mention um, the confessors. And, and you said that, that in the way confessors are very much um, bonded with the papal authority, that there is some sort of a prolongation of the papal power. How, how do you understand that? What is this, this connection between, between confessors and, and papal power? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, I was using it in the sense that um, Diane Elliott uh, argues. Uh, so just to expand a little bit um, on what she argues and how I see this kind of playing out in, in some of what it is that I'm seeing. Um, she, her book analyzes the, uh, the emergence of um, the, the confessor penitent relationship from the time at which the Inquisition was established. So she's drawing on, on work from sort of both, uh, both inquisitions into sanctity and into heresy to argue that the confessor penitent relationship that um, women, uh, that yeah, conf <laughs> the confessor penitent relationship that is uh, portrayed uh, in kind of quite an extreme fashion in saints' lives, like the life of Elizabeth of Hungary, um, becomes a, a symbol for orthodoxy. The reason that she argues this is because, um, because they were barred from ordination, women were kind of especially lay, and so uh, their performative submission to their confessors becomes a, a symbol for, a, a, a kind of a broader symbol kind of for orthodoxy and, uh, and the way that that is kind of portrayed uh, in um, in saints' lives from the period where we start to see inquisitions not only into heresy but into sanctity uh, onwards. Um, so not only so we we might kind of initially come to these texts and think, okay, that's um, you know it's just kind of men oppressing women, and that's and it, in one sense kind of it is. But there's something a bit more interesting going on there. It's also uh, the use of women as as people considered especially lay um, as a way of modeling uh, obedience to uh, to the confessor who at the time um, began to be seen more as an uh, so confessors were also often inquisitors the role kind of switched over and more um, kind of as an arm of establishing orthodoxy and establishing um, relationships kind of with, with the papacy um, and I think the reason why I talked about it is that I think we are liable to sometimes to forget that the friars are often used in this way. Um, we often tend to see the friars as, or not so much anymore, but certainly kind of in older scholarship, friars are often seen as being kind of opposed to the papacy, uh, particularly the Franciscans, but in they, when we can we look at the some of the saints' lives um, that I've been talking about, they 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 punctuate the lives of these women saints, uh, these female saints. They oversee uh, they oversee penance, um, despite the fact often that we know that many of the women who we were looking at um, have you know, are are able to kind of to stand up for themselves. They negotiate with the papacy. The papacy see them as being very important during their lives. Um, this, they, there is a sort of the ultimate kind of submission to to the friars, and I, yeah, I just sort of wanted to test really whether that was maybe a continuation of what we're seeing in some of the, in some of what we see in Elizabeth's relationship with her confessor Conrad of Marburg. Um, I hope that that wasn't too rudimentary, and that answers your your question. Thank you. So. And other voices. Okay, uh, let me uh, add some uh, uh, remarks to uh, Carolina's paper on at the end. Uh, we used to see uh, the events uh, of eleven uh, seventy nine in Krakow uh, through the strongly through the perspective of. Uh, what was later uh, the promotion and devel early development and promotion of the cult of Saint Stanislaus? Um, it's of course probably right because there are there is a, some kind of competition between the, uh, these two cults, 
in the 13th century, but I wonder if uh, the other perspective is correct or not, uh, the perspective of uh, what was earlier. Uh, so I, I, I think that we should uh, see the, this translation of Florian to Krakow uh, also through the perspective of the uh, two earlier uh, um, translations or attempt of translation in one case, the relics of St. Vincent to Wrocław organized in 1145 uh, by the powerful, one of the most powerful men in Poland in 12th century, Piotr Wostowicz, but probably with the participation of uh, Wroclaw Bishop, because these relics are in late Middle Ages also in the cathedral church. And the second case, uh, uh, attempt of uh, translation of relics of uh, uh, Saint Henry, Emperor Henry, and uh, Saint Sigismund to, to Płock by Bishop Werner in 1165. Uh, I think that this uh, case uh, of Krakow is uh, more close uh, to the uh, level of religi religious culture uh, comparable with with this with the, these uh, two events uh, uh, earlier, then with the and the, with the development and the promotion of a local uh, cult of bishops uh, Saint Saint Stanislaus. What's your opinion about this? Because in my concern, uh, it belongs more to the religious culture, to the level of religious culture and the phase of religious culture of the 12th century than than later. But you mean, of course, the, the cult of Saint Stanislaus, not the translation of Saint Florian. Because Saint Stanislaus as a local bishop, yeah, a martyr, not... Uh, this was the question. Mm. Not really... Not, the question, because... Sorry, I didn't... Uh, I'm not sure whether... I had an impression you were talking about uh, religious culture uh, involving the cult of Saint Florian and his translation. And then you said about the earlier cases involving involving the um, the imports but I, what was the what was your last question was it about the religious culture of uh, saint stanislas or saint florian and to which of the uh, which of the events it belongs in a you know uh, i meant the um, more mm -hmm. uh, 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 accurate comparison uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, of the translation of, of Saint Adalbert to the to the promotion of the two foreign uh, mm -hmm. cults uh, mm -hmm. from the 12th century, then to the to the uh, promotion and development of of, of uh, Saint Stanislaus cults and native uh, root, uh, deeply rooted in the. Crack of uh, ecclesiastical milieu and so on. Mm -hmm. it's, only, yes, so uh, it's only su more suggestion than the mm -hmm. question, of course. Yes, yeah, so, and this is how I understood it. So, yeah. uh, yes, so you're right. Uh, of course, Saint Stanislaus is something we didn't really have before. We didn't have a native, uh, uh, native martyr bishop yet, yeah, who was uh, whose cult has a, had a chance to uh, grow in power in a in a quick time, in fact. But in case of Florian and the, um, all the, uh, the background and the religious and cultural background, I think that d despite the, uh, what I was saying that, uh, about his initial successes, the case of Florian, it was a random import, really, of a, of a saint who just wasn't... Um, the, the wo there weren't any... Um, precise expectations. I think this, uh, what I mentioned from the sources, this in fact might be true. That's why uh, there are these stories of, um, the, of the Pope asking um, as a joke, which, which of you wants to go to Poland? And there is um, Florian who um, raises his hand. And this story is repeated in uh, the account by Dugos and also in this legendary Translatio Sancti Floriani. So I think this is something um, with no comparison, really. And so thank you for the suggestion. I think I should... Um,
I should have, have a, you know, have a deeper uh, investigation in this direction, so. Thank you. So, I don't see any other claims to, to the voice, and so I think that we can close our discussion. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance and Grzegorz, do you want to say something at the end? Oh, okay. Right. Thank, thank you very much. So, so we are ending successfully, I hope. The first day, thank you for, for all papers. For, thank you for, for our, uh, our questions and participation in discussions. Um, thank you very much. Um, so it seems that we are not very lucky with the protection of St. Olaf, or maybe we are not enough devoted to St. Olaf, because as you probably noticed uh, Jerzy Pysiak's paper on St. Olaf um, uh, was not delivered today and, and tomorrow we unfortunately will not have a paper of Helen uh, as she informed us uh, uh, yesterday evening, uh, which, is, which was also supposed to be about St. Olaf. So, <laughs> uh, but, but there are some chance I hope that maybe, maybe Jerzy will, be, will manage to, to present his paper tomorrow instead of, of Helen. So, so I propose that we can meet at nine as it is scheduled in the program and, and hopefully there will be three papers on the first session. And the second will be about St. Olaf, but not uh, by Helen. So, so thank you again very much for this, this first day and, and see you all, um, I hope, tomorrow. And have a good evening. <laughs>